I don't know that that does much. And it does, uh, especially if you got people who, uh, a lot of people are, are um, like to stay on uh, channels that they're loyal to. So, But the only thing is you wouldn't be able to do drawings or, or, or go into yeah. chat with that. But uh, it does. It, it really does help. Well, yeah, my station isn't on most of the time. so I, And I don't think it alerts anybody when I host someone else. So I right, think, right. Yeah, I don't think people... And uh, a lot of channels, like one thing, I, I don't like run, hosting reruns. So I, I don't... A lot of I won't auto host, uh, you know, uh, right. some of my uh, friends who do uh, who do that. So, hey, thanks, Troy. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that sub, that resub. This is a little too old. This Reaper uh, ad. So <laughs> it's it's almost two years old. I just uh, get me new material. But Reaper's been a great sponsor. Hey, it worked. Awesome. Make sure to hit that mute button. That was loud. Cool. Yeah. Oh, I see it. The Reaper ad. Yeah. Should I not talk over it? No. Wow. We can talk. Look, we're talking all we want. Hey, Jim. Hey, Wiley. All right. Here we go. That's what I like to hear. Oh, I should get the chat now so I can see. Yeah, absolutely. And just mute that out. You're good. They are. Uh, Here we go. Yeah, because we'll be on a lot of. Uh, so, yeah, Wiley Hobbit is Scott Fry, and I'm Jay Scott. So there's always confusions <laughs> there. But Wiley's got a channel too. I just hit, hit him with a shout out. I got you too set on the. Uh, there you go. Did that come up? Oh, I shouldn't have run that one twice. See, look, I missed my I missed my cue there. <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> They'll all laugh it up there. All right, let's get some troll lord here. Troller had a great has a great Kickstarter for Castles and Crusades. It ended, so uh, I'm running oh. a still for them. And uh, uh, the custom covers like that's an ode. That background picture is an ode to the Player's Handbook First Edition. They have one. It's an ode to the Dungeon Master's Guide. Really great artwork. Um, so uh, looking forward to getting our hands on those when they're available after uh, um, after they get it all going for the Kickstarter. Definitely, really cool. I, uh, we'll have a nice crowd tonight. I think we'll we'll, we'll get cool. It'll be good. Yeah, everyone's looking forward to this discussion. This is, you know, I don't even think this will be an addition war thing at all. I think it'll just be what addition we do. War. We what, we're all playing D and D. That's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> right. I, I I try and stay away from that as much as possible. Yeah, you know? no. yeah. I love all D and D. All editions, right? Yeah, I've, I've even I've, fourth. <laughs> Maybe even fourth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even fourth. My uh, wife still, I think my wife still prefers fourth. Even we've been playing fifth for six years, and I think she still, she has parts of fourth that like she clearly still loves and wishes she had. So. And lots of people. There's a lot, of, a lot of interesting. Am I talking over ads? Again? No, you're good. Keep um, on talking, man. Right. If, uh, there's lots of interesting. So there's a lot of, in my opinion, a lot of rose-colored glasses currently going on with people looking back at four e and, and talking it up. And I'm like, man, I was there. Like, I played the hell out of it. I wrote and for it. You wrote a lot for yeah, it. Yeah, I wrote a lot for it. And like, man, it had problems. <laughs> like, it was, it had interesting bits, and there was some babies thrown out with some of the bathwater. We, um, we we talked but, about on a previous show about like, uh, what's it when you have the players make certain goals? What's that called? And that started in fourth, and that was a really good. Um, uh, not not skill challenges. Yeah, skill challenges. Yeah. Yeah, people yeah. love that, but yeah. man, I never got them to work. No. Okay. No, they okay. were too structured. They were. There was too. The, the the problem was it, it tried to gamify something that works way better when you just kind of run it naturally. So like if you okay. if you're gonna run a I'm gonna turn this one down. Okay. if you're gonna run a scene and you're going to um, have a bunch of different things happening in that scene, it's very dynamic. Like whether they succeed or fail, or who succeeds or fails, or what they're trying to do. Right. And when you had a skill challenge, it was always like you you kind of abstracted all of the rolling from the things that were happening in the world and it was like you just went down this spreadsheet of checks and okay. then tallied up the end and some people I never, still yeah some we people kind of like do, we kind of like do that and don't even realize it right and they kind and of we do it dynamically yeah right? like yeah you know we, we we sort of listen to what the right. you know That's listen cool. to what the player describes they want to do pick the appropriate skill have them roll it see if they succeed and then arbitrate what happens after that and then go to the next one so you might have a skill challenge but they're dynamic skill challenges they're not this like, okay. worksheet and so the, if you read like old 4e material about how they did skill challenges they were these really rigid like they can do these three skills 
and this is kind of what it equates to in game and this is how many points you get for accomplishing them and then after so many successes or so many failures the challenge is either succeed or fail okay so uh it doesn't work like that when i run my games you 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 weren't a weren't a fan of that okay it's good no. to know but uh, it's funny because that's one of the things that a lot of people are like, oh man i really liked it like, uh, i mean i'm good on it like if it works for him it works for him right but wrote them and I tried them and I wrote all kinds of articles about how to do them yeah. many, many times. Well, it's good to know. It's Because, it's, you know, a lot of stuff from me being such an old scorer, what's up there, Dwayne Prometheus? Uh, we, do, we do stuff that I guess they quantified in later editions, you know? We always would, would I guess we would do stuff like that all the time yeah, they, and just they don't tried, even realize it. Yeah, I mean, before he tried to gamify, you know, sort of wrap mechanics around a lot of the things that sort of came naturally because right. the argument was that they were trying to account, they were trying to normalize DMing. Like, they were trying to baseline dungeon mastering. And every and that way, like, if you went from one game to another game, you knew that it was going to play a certain way. And, and really... But they realized with you know they, they kind of went back to it fifth and then if you if you went to um, you know certainly the older games it's very dependent on how the dm runs things right and, right. and it didn't okay. matter like 4e it's still dependent on how the dm ran things so they, they weren't able to sort of you know um normalize normalize the dming side of it and okay uh, yeah so it didn't, it didn't work out i don't think it worked out like they planned and i think uh, you know the, the i think the the numbers kind of show it that like fifth edition is you know, not that it's not an edition war, because first edition is awesome too. Um, the fifth edition is the most successful version of DD has ever been. You know, according to a bunch of different things. And it is way bigger than four years ago. Oh my gosh, yeah. So, you know, I think there's some you know, and there's a lot of circumstance and streaming and all sorts of other things that sort of kinda of count for that. But I think a lot of it is the, the game kind of went back to the things that work best in the older versions. And remember the fact that the DM is the arbiter of the experience. I think it worked out for, for me you know uh i've developed and a lot of people call it i guess one point j or whatever so yeah right. you know it just uh and uh, you know there's 40, certain, 40 years of house ruling yeah exactly it just evolved <laughs> i picked from 2e yeah. i picked from 3e i've never taken anything from four that i'm aware of yeah um and and uh or five i you know but we have a hero point system it's kind of similar to inspiration kind of or you know uh but we we developed that way back in uh i don't know the 80s you know it's just uh, but it's it's funny how there's parallels you know uh, and uh just i don't i played 5e multiple times and uh it, but my guys were just like it's not for me, right? Yeah, it's just I mean, not. if you dig what you dig, right? yeah, like, and and that's a thing. And the makers of D&D, Wizards of the Coast, said, they're like, "Wait, we just want people to play D&D. Like, we're we're happy. They've said it multiple times. Like, do we want you to buy Five E? Sure, that'd be great. But you know, we just want people playing D&D. And if you think about it, even from a you know, complete capitalist standpoint, so if you're playing D&D and you're broadcasting the fact that you're playing D, you're helping Five E, even if you're not playing Five E, right? So like, I, yeah, I have a question for you. So you want Anna yeah. to join us? Sure, if she wants. Yes, to okay, I'm going to put type it in. Uh, I'll put Mike wants you to join. Why don't you to come on? So, uh, and look, I missed a cue there. So, uh, what time is it? Oh, look at that. We're getting close here. Notice I have stinger transitions after two and a half years. I finally figured out how to do that, everyone. <laughs> Took me that long. So, there you go, Anna. I don't know what a stinger transition is. Uh, like, what, see, when you do a scene switch and it, uh, 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 those uh, swords come up. Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, like the scene. There she comes. Hey, Anna. Hi, Anna. Hi. I don't know if you and I have met in person before. I've seen you at conventions from time to time. Oh, yes. I know about you, but you know, we haven't said hi, I think. But, yeah. But yeah, but I know about you and your awesome books and stuff. So I, I know yeah. about you and your awesome work. <laughs> oh, thank you. So, yeah. Awesome. That's Big great. Big fan of your work on, on, at Global Press. I'm a huge Global yeah. Press nerd. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, um, Anna's uh, does a lot for the community and a lot for me. 
a lot. I mean, <laughs> plus I'm edit, editing her map for my campaign, so. Yeah, well, um, yeah, this is one of my, my PR outlets. My campaign has a professional cartographer on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. And a good friend, too, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that's that's awesome. So, and, and, yeah, Jay has such a good job doing it. Yeah, I've, I've, yeah, I've watched you on this channel. Okay, great. Yeah, the Saturday night game. That was yep. uh, when uh, Anna was. All righty. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I got a lot of Mike's uh, accomplishments up here in the <laughs> publication. So, uh, yeah. tonight, a good one. DM's go to references. It's going to be a really cool discussion. Plus, it's going to get, you know, so a lot of things that happened the last like three weeks. I got all this custom new music. I got uh, I got my stinger transitions. I mean, it's like I got. Uh, yeah, you overhauled the, the entire. Thing. Yeah, I'm trying to step yeah. it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, because I have to, because the uh, giant blue box is pushing me. You know what I mean? Which is good. Well, all all this stuff. Cats. Pushing their cats away. Oh yeah, yeah. It was my, my little My mind doggy. suddenly is like, oh, that's that your dog? Yeah. Yep. Yep. My. Own. I suddenly, I suddenly have a cat who's like super interested. Oh, see. In yep. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, I'll have a cat just flopping. No, the only problem with her is that she will she will stick her nose on the microphone and short it out with static electricity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come here, you cat. Yep. Yeah, we all need our familiars, especially in times like this. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Lot of. A lot of COVID beasts. I may have yep. to up your windows a little bit. I'm going to up your windows a little bit and probably mess the whole stream up. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> so uh, ignore the uh, ignore this uh, little uh, change here as I make Ooh, a little bit of a afraid. change. I'm Jay Killor Gazumba, and with me as usual is the wonderful Anna Meyer. Anna is uh, fantastic, and everyone knows uh, what a great job Anna does for the community and our very special guest tonight for this discussion, and I'm so happy he came on. Uh, Mike's and... Sly Flourish, Shay? Is yeah, that how, sure. how you pronounce it? I, I have to ask, where did that name come from, Mike? Uh, not being a fourth edition guy, you wouldn't know. Uh, I'm not. But it, is, it is actually a power, a rogue power uh, that you can get in, in, in fourth edition. And I got it because I just started hitting domain names. Oh, and, okay. Uh, was running through a list of them, and luckily that one was free. And so wow. Slyflourish.com okay. is free. I will grab that. So that is a rogue. That was a fourth edition rogue fourth power. Fourth edition rogue power, yeah. Yep. yep. Well, you, you taught me something there. I did not know that. <laughs> Very yeah. cool. Well, so. Yeah, Sly Flourish is interesting because you used your charisma bonus to do an attack roll. Like really? you were stat. Yeah, that's why it was it's called Sly Flourish, and it was intended that you would, you know, you're doing like wavy stuff. And so it was your charisma. You could attack with a rapier. With a charisma bonus and do charisma damage by poking them. Yep. <laughs> Can I, I have to ask why. It's, a cool <laughs> Look, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's one of these things if you want to murder someone at a diplomatic, right. like a dinner or something right, like right. that, when you kind of have oh. the social conversation and then you just yeah. want to kill someone from. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think wow. it's really just a bunch cool. of fancy moves, right? Exactly, You're doing a bunch yeah. of fancy moves and you poke them in the jugular yeah. and, you use and blood that thing thing over, and, yeah. and hypnotize the target kind of thing. Yeah. So, that yeah. is crazy. Uh, I well, I, hey, I, I know they had all sorts of different things uh, with monks yeah. and uh, and stats, but I didn't know with rogues as well. Yeah. Or oh, was yeah. It? Okay. Yeah. Everybody was a wizard in 4th edition. Like, yeah, exactly. wi wizards, yeah. wizards weren't like wizards, and but everybody was like them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you just yeah, all have set powers that were right. the same way, depending on if you were a fighter or a wizard. Right. It was just that fighter made weird attacks and stuff, and, and the wizard cast spells. So, yeah. But they were AE, all very... They called it an AEDU. You had your, your at-wills, your encounter powers, yeah. your mm -hmm. daily powers, and your utility powers, and everybody yeah. had them, whatever yep. race you, whatever whatever class you picked, which meant they yep. were all roughly the same complexity level as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was... You didn't have, like, the fighter that just hits once with a sword. You had... Fighters have all the, you know, crazy whirlwind attacks and mm -hmm. yep. all kinds of stuff, yeah. So, tonight, we're going to really get into some meat here, hopefully, which is really cool. But before that... I got to get my notes. You got to get your notes. <laughs> Notice I brought my library from downstairs. Plus, I brought that, <laughs> that, that play, the, my, my players, the touch only these books, even though you don't ever listen pile, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I brought that pile up here too. It's the, the, yeah, you, yeah, you need it to feel like you're prepped. Ab yeah. Absolutely. So uh, Casey, yeah. you're too early. We got some great giveaways tonight for the holidays, and one of them, Mike, explain what you're going to uh, the grand giveaway prize tonight would be from you as far as uh, um, your your generosity.
opportunity there. Yeah, so I want to I want to give away like the big Sly Flourish pack, which is I think four books. Uh, the Lazy Dun uh, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, uh, the Lazy DM's workbook. Both of them are adamantine bestsellers on Drive Through RPG. Um, very, they're both popular books, and uh, well, you know, people people seem to dig them. Um, my my last latest book, which is uh, Ruins of the Grendel Root, a book of ten adventures uh, set in a big underground big underground cave complex, um, and cool. one that I'm immensely proud of. Uh, the hardest hardest book I ever you know I, I I've never worked harder on anything else in my life than than doing that book, uh, and it's a beautiful book. If I do say so myself. Awesome. And um, Fantastic Adventures, which is the the book that came before that, and then art books and map packs and all the things you need in order to play them online. Everything you need. So that'll be one big pack. All the digital. That's a digital pack. Yes. And a lot of these are here, right? There's a Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, uh, DM's yep. Workbook, Fantastic Adventures, Fantastic Locations, uh, Ruins of Gunderwood. So and uh, so they're all here. Um, in addition, we're going to give away another 30, courtesy of some of our viewers and our sponsors, a $30 gift certificate to Troller Games' store. And a $25 gift certificate to Reaper Miniatures store as well from other great sponsors. So we're going to do three giveaways tonight. Uh, but uh, Mike's will be the first one. The first winner will get that, that fantastic uh, collection uh, that a lot of them will probably discuss tonight. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I'm really excited about this talk. So we've had... This year we've had, let's see, we had Len, you know, before Leonard passed, we had Leonard on like forty times. We had Eric Mona, we've had Luke, we've had, you know, we've had a great, a great crew, and uh, this will probably be our last special guest of the year. Yeah, Mike. You, you just kept scraping the bottom. Of the <laughs> no, fine, no, no, no. we'll have that slight first guy. Started out at the bottom of the balance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jake moved his way up. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. That doesn't sound like it. Wolfgang, Sean Reynolds, we got better and you better know. guests through the years. So, yeah. Uh, um, Skip Williams, it's been a, a wonderful year, and we'll talk about that on Tuesday on our on our year in review show awesome. uh, that we have at the end of every year. But I'm really excited to have you because I know we, you and I are just going to talk DMs turkey, you know? Sure. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself, please, for people who don't uh, may not know you, how you got it, how you started with D and D, uh, and how you got into writing, and uh, where you are at, at, at today at this point. Sure. So um, getting into writing was pretty easy. My, my, my father was a freelance writer. Um, my father wrote a book called Illuminatus, which you may have heard of. It was the book that kind of spawned the Illuminati games that oh, are cool. big in RPG circles. Um, so yeah, my, my father and another author, Robert Anton Wilson, wrote that back in the 70s. Uh, so and my dad was a writer the whole time I was growing up. So writing was pretty cool. I don't know. It's kind of cool. Like it's my dad. So it's kind of cool. Um, but I never had a problem writing, and so I wrote all the time. Um, and I wrote lots of stuff before I got into D into D and D. I got into D and D when I was about fourteen or fifteen years old. With sec uh, was it second edition at the time? I think it was second edition at the time. My my best friend, uh, who I've been friends with for over forty years, was into the old red box stuff. You know, the, the ECMI. And um, uh, I missed out, right? Like, you know, I was like, I don't know what that is. And I wasn't really interested. And so, and I always, I talked to him about it because uh, now like I'm into it and he's, he's doing real life stuff. And, you know, I'm like, man, I wish I'd played with you back then. <laughs> like yeah. that would have been a good time. Um, so played a little bit in high school, played a bunch in college. Then after college, uh, played with my, my, my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife. And um, awesome. kind of played pretty regularly for, I think about the last... 14 or 15 years we've had a weekly game going different people in and out and we played 3.5 4e and 5e uh, along with little stints of pathfinder 13th age shadow the demon lord fate and some other some other systems in there from time to time um i started writing about D, &D right around the time fourth edition was just coming out they were just talking about it and I, there was a local game convention called Winter Fantasy that has since yeah. used to be in D.C. and now moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana. But when it was in D.C., I went there, and it was the first time they did anything with 4E. And I, they didn't really prohibit you from taking pictures of stuff, including character sheets and little like two-page write-up things that were kind of like adventures. And I, so I, so I took pictures of it and I put it on the net, saying, "Hey, there's like, do you want to see what 4E looks like? This is what 4E looks like." And I really wanted to like, do we ha do we have enough material that we could actually run a 4E game? And we had enough that we could kind of run it. You had pre-gen characters and a little bit of an adventure and a few monsters. 
And that was really popular at the time because nobody else was really writing. There was no blogs about 4E because nobody really knew anything about it. And um, so I, 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 I had enough you know, kind of people interested in that. And I've been writing blogs for a long time before that. I wrote a blog for EverQuest, the, the video, the, the computer game, uh, massive online game called EverQuest, uh, which I played for five years. And I had, I had my 10,000, yeah, I had 10,000 hours in that one. Um, but I met my wife there. So it was nice. definitely worth, it was definitely worth the 10,000 hours. Um, and so, I, but I wrote a lot for that. I wrote a blog. There was a blog called Mob Hunter that I wrote for for that. So I was used to writing like weekly articles and knew I could do it and, and had a fair bit of experience behind behind that. And um, so it was easy to switch over to talk, but I was kind of done with EverQuest and I was getting back into D&D. So it was very easy to switch over to write about D&D. So I started up Sly Flourish. I mentioned that I got the URL, you know, the URL for Sly Flourish was open. Slyflourish.com was open. So I said, hey, I'll grab that and then that'll be fine. And never really thought about it <laughs> since then. Uh, and wrote weekly art. You know, my plan was weekly articles and daily tweets uh, about D and D. And both of those have gone well. They've been going on for more than ten years now, about eleven years now. And uh, I started writing books. Uh, I started with a very small book called Sly Flourish's Dungeon Master Tips, which was just like little tips and tricks for running Fourth Edition of D and D, and you know things that I was picking up from other people I was talking to. A lot of other bloggers uh, that were that were writing about it at the time, and we were getting ideas together, and I put it together in a book, and that was fine. Uh, this pre Kickstarter, they didn't have Kickstarter for anything like this. Uh, I wrote another little book that was really narrow called um, "Running Epic Tier Games," which was a book designed to help people run the level twenty one to thirty parts of Fourth Edition, uh, which never really sold very well, but I was pretty happy with it. It was a fun, a fun little book, and I still think there's some useful stuff in there. I ended up giving that away, so now it's on. The full text of the book is on Sly Flourish if you want to read it. Cool. Um, and I, uh, uh, so then I wrote a book. My third book was called The Lazy Dungeon Master. And uh, again, I hadn't kickstarted it yet, um, but it kind of hit a niche. And it's, it's the, you know, I had seen so much. This is right at the transition between 4E and 5E. And it was in the D&D Next time. So I was, we were just getting experience with D&D Next. And it was kind of showing a lot of us who had been sort of spent a lot of our time in the 3.5 and 4e world we're sort of getting that glimpse of the much more refined version of DD that used to exist back in the first and second edition days i think you know but with sort of cleaned up mechanics and and, and things that you know in incrementing ac and incrementing attack bonuses and stuff like that that made sense and you know didn't have to worry about that though mm -hmm. and charts and um we uh so we were just getting this view of it and one thing that was pretty clear to me was that uh not only were people like throwing away all this prep that they were doing. Uh, but they were, uh, it turned out that the less people prepped, the better their game was. And it was huh. a common thing that I heard among many, many people was you, you prep less, your, your game goes more. But it wasn't like a pure, like don't prep at all and everything will be fine. It right. was like you had to prep the right things. And so the concept of the Lazy Dungeon Master is what are the things you need to prep? What's the minimum you need to prep? that can keep a game fast and flexible when the players jog left, uh, but gives you enough that you can actually run a game and feel pretty good about it. And that, that book did very well and, and people were very happy with it. And at that point, Kickstarter came out and, and I was like, okay, my next one's gonna be a Kickstarter. And I ran a very small Kickstarter for a book called Aeon Wave, which is a um, fate-based cyberpunk game. Uh, very small, you know, self -com you know, complete, you needed fate, but you have, if you had fate in this book, you could play it. And it was a it was sort of a one shot game based on a few different science fiction concepts like the uh, um, what is it called when the, the the AI singularity and the simulation argument and a whole bunch of other sort of science fictiony sort of things and uh, that you know was that got me to try out Kickstarter and I was that worked out for me that idea of running a small one I only had a couple hundred people that backed it but it was enough that I could do a nice black and white booklet in print on demand. And uh, then I started to do bigger Kickstarters. I did Fantastic Locations, uh, which got more people. That was in the high hundreds. Uh, I did Fantastic Adventure, was where I broke a thousand. And then uh, finally, I, I, I was sitting around. And I was like, you know, people are still buying the Lazy Dungeon Master, and I still like the book, but I'm not running my games like that anymore. I've refined that process since then. I've talked to a lot of people. We now have multiple. We now have years of Five E that we've been running. And I played a whole bunch of other systems too at that point. And 
I've surveyed a lot of DMs and I've gotten interviews with DMs about how they do these things. And I really want to do another book, but am I going to break the lazy dungeon master? Like the book's already popular, it's still selling every month. Why would I right. make, why would I shake that up? But I was like, you know, but it, I, I'm going to shake it up because it needs something. So I said, I'm going to do another small black and white book and, um, and I'll kickstart that one too. Cause I did the other ones and it turned out to be a massive hit. I got 6,000 backers. Uh, and the, um, you know, we went from the small booklet to a large, uh, you know, hundred more than you know, 110, 120 page book, full color, lots of color art, beautiful cover, uh, cool. you know, and, and, uh, and a whole second book. So the, the lazy DM workbook turned out to be the stretch goal for that. that. And the lazy DM workbook sells almost as well as return does. Awesome. So both of them, yeah, both, it turned out that, that, that again, was very lucky. And, and I think the right place at the right time. And, um, uh, so that came out and that, then that kind of moved up, up a notch, you know, then suddenly more people had heard about Sly Flourish and I was able to kind of expand, expand what I was doing into other areas. So I made a couple books of adventures, fantastic adventures and ruins of the Grendel Root both came out after, uh, return. And, uh, last year myself and James Indercasso, who is a, uh, author for, he's a freelance author for Wizards of the Coast. He's done a bunch of different hardcover books for Wizards of the Coast and, podcast network and he and i have been friends for years and my other friend scott fitzgerald gray who's an editor for wizards of the coast and uh has he's edited on the core books he's in the you know edited the monster manual and uh the three of us have been working on a book called fantastic layers uh which is a book of 23 layers that you can drop into any 5e game wherever you need them they're like boss battles that you can drop in anywhere you need them so they're they're not really full adventures um they are uh, uh, they are, they are small modular boss fights that you can drop into your campaign anywhere you want to go. Um, so really, you know, so that book's, I think we're going to release it next week. I think that's, you know, oh, we've cool. been working on it all year and we're really close to having it done with the, the burn. There's just the final bits of layout. Uh, we had a lot of play testing. It was really important to play test it thoroughly. So we had a long play test process. And um, yeah, and for the Kickstarter backers, they'll be getting it. Uh, they'll be getting it next week, and I think the PDF will be up for sale on Drive Through next week as well. So fantastic! Yeah. So you're just you're staying busy. You're staying busy. Yeah. Uh, well, now I'm on this Twitch thing, which you know about. Yes. Right? And I'm doing more on YouTube, and so I'm kind of expanding what I do. Uh, my books have been doing well enough that I've been able to take more, you know, some regular like l reduce my hours at my day job. So now I have like Sly Flourish Day, which is Friday, where I'm just all day, I'm spending kind of digging into this stuff. So it's, it's more than just a nights and weekends sort of thing. Um, and I'm trying a lot of stuff out, you know, like my, my I'm, I'm not, I'm trying, my, my goal isn't really to like make a ton of money because there's not a ton of money in this, in this industry. Really. Yeah, we, I was going to say, don't um, get in this to earn money. <laughs> no, but you know, I want to help the M's, right? I want to, I, yeah. I think I, you know, my, not to, not to preach, but I'll preach a little bit, um, you know, and I think we all know this, that like D and D and then like, boy, COVID really reinforced this, that D and D is important, right? Gosh. Our ability to get together with our friends and family and have a joint activity where we could be creative and funny and be kids again, you know, we yeah. can't overstate like how valuable that is. And in, the science shows it saves lives, yeah. you know, like, mm -hmm. like connections to other people and staying, staying connected to other people yeah. uh, is, is, you know, more important than, oh, yeah you know, working out, <laughs> right? Like you should do both. Yeah. But the reality is like all the things that we get on our, ourselves about for not doing uh, physically, mentally getting together with friends and family is really important. And I've had my groups have, you know, all of my groups have said like, you know, we've all been at home because of COVID and we've been playing online. And uh, all of them have been saying like, you know, this has been, I don't know what I'd have done if I didn't have this ability to, to keep playing D&D. I'm actually playing more D&D now than i was before covid yeah and um uh yeah so so i i think it's important so therefore i think that w trying to help people have an easier time dming fit it into their schedules you know refine things down i've been racking my brain recently just really trying to think about like how do we streamline this even further how do we you know how if you know the the, the conversation i was having on discord discord's been another thing I've, I've i've got a discord channel with a bunch of people in it mm -hmm. and it's a great place to just like shoot ideas around and 
you know, we have channels for, for people to come and talk about their campaign and we help them out, but then also general chat channels that are like our coffee bars. And that to me, like, I, I like to hang out at coffee bars and I'm not hanging at coffee bars right now. So I hang out at my discord because it's like my coffee bar. And, uh, the yeah, last year has been yeah. crazy, right? It's been insane. We just, yeah. you know, the world is upside down, but for us, it's been an opportunity, and I don't want to say yeah. that in a in a negative way. I want to say yeah, that like in a, a lot of way. right, a yeah. lot of terrible things happened, but some nice, you know, they're 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 they're, and nothing will make up for the terrible things that happened. But um, yeah, like for me, I really did try to say it. Like I went from there was never a question of me not continuing to play D anD D, and it was like I, I actually was a little bit excited at the time to say. I get to try a whole new way to play this game that I haven't really used. I've never really played online seriously. And now I'm playing all my games. Like I went from, you know, zero games played online to a hundred games playing online in a year. Yeah. Right. And now I've got yeah. a fair bit of experience running games online and I'm able to recommend it and, and sort of listen to a lot of people. This is something I like to do. I like to listen to lots of people, get lots of different ways that people have done it, draw that information in and, and refine it down and try it and then yeah. put it out in somewhere like a, a YouTube video. Here, how to use Discord to play D&D. Right? right or how to use Albert Rodeo, my new my new favorite VTT, or um, I've never know, even heard of that. Also, so, Albert yeah, Albert Rodeo. Al, yeah, Albert Rodeo is fantastic. So Albert Rodeo is a virtual tabletop. It's made by two folks in Australia that built it during COVID times. Uh, it is a no login virtual tabletop with no fixed rule set. You're, it's just tokens on maps. It's tokens, fog of war, and huh. maps. And um, it is, in my experience, using it with a bunch of different groups, it's the easiest way to get like a VTT in front of people, both as a DM to kind of put your maps up in there, and both as a player to move a token, move tokens around in the map. So I it doesn't have all the game already. I've, What's I've that? seen yeah, the website. Right. I started the game already. Exactly. <laughs> <It's> really, <laughs> like, for the people. Anna, can you link it in chat, please? Yep. Yep. Thanks. It's albert.rodeo. Yeah. It's yep. a really easy URL, and it's yeah, it's free, and. Um, it is for, for the people who find that the bigger VTTs, your foundries and your um, v fantasy, fantasy grounds and your yeah. roll twenties, if if you find that they're just kind of heavy and it's hard to get you know, like people logged in and it's hard to get the character sheets integrated and it's hard to associate your stat block with your token and all that kind of stuff. If that's if that's kind of for some people like they're wired in. Like I've got friends that love Foundry, just love it, and for them it's like a you know, it's like a, you know, a video board for shooting movies. They can do everything in it, you know, animated backgrounds and sparkle effects and music and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's really interesting. But if, they, if you're on the other side, like, I don't have time for all that. And I just need to get to tokens on a map. Albert Rodeo are tokens on a map. Awesome. So, yeah. Because a lot, I mean, a lot of DMs are going to theater of the minded, except for certain combat situations. And that's yep. where it comes into play, you know, um, my good friend Brian, uh, which everyone knows, who DMs on the channel once in a blue moon. He's a Fantasy Grounds guy. Will uh, from uh, Wicked Studios. He's a Roll Twenty guy. But then this this may be a, a very happy medium for a lot of those theater of the mind players who just want to have that situation here. Yeah. There. So I, I I'm cool. a theater of the mind guy too. Um, I I tend to prefer it. I like the high action. I like the cinematic sort of feel to it. Um, and I've in, I figured out a way in Discord to have what I call like a one-dimensional battle map, which is essentially just markdown text with the names of characters in different positions, so you can see like which which names which characters are next to which monsters and which monsters are far away, and you can do zones in it. And I use that primarily, but there are times where it's like if I have a battle map and I have tokens and we have sort of a complex environment. I'll need a VTT, but I don't want to set up a whole roll 20 thing. Yeah. And I could just fire off a Albert Rodeo URL. They can hit it and they can see it and they can move it around. Very cool. So yeah, it's real neat. I, I just, I love that there's all of these tools. And my, I say it like in every, in everything I do with this, it's like whatever tools you're using to keep playing D&D &D are the yeah. right tools. Like there's no perfect tool. That We're all just looking at the wide range of tool sets and you find the one that works best for you. And, and, you know, what's most important is that you're still playing D&D, &D, <laughs> you know, when, when, when it can be hard. And uh, that is, um, for me, we had to figure out if I could do it all, me by, sitting at the table with everyone remote during the really bad days of COVID. You know what right. I mean? So yeah, that right. was like, and uh, I did it. I did it at cons. So uh, yeah. now we're going to have so some, you, it's going to be you a had like a You had like a camera on it and you would move the stuff around and they would see uh, it all? I, th all my, I have three cameras running live. When yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> crazy. I had all three right. still. And yeah. uh, we figured out how to do it. And yeah. Um, 
I'm yeah, comfortable I did that, with I it. I did that with some Dwarven Forge stuff too. So I had a couple of games where, where I, I built Dwarven Forge setups. And then I would use my phone and a tripod sitting over the top of it. And then players could tell me where they wanted to move stuff and I could move it around. And, and they, they, I would do both screenshots. So they have these really nice high res screenshots that would show them the, 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 the cool details. And then they could also see generally from the little fuzzy thumbnails. So yeah, that, that can work too. And I think there's a whole VTT that's designed that way. Um, they did a Kickstarter for one. Uh, it's uh, virtual on, tabletop like ago. that. No, I can't. I don't remember. No, what I forget what it's called. Tabletop it simulators one. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. This one, this one specifically ha came with a camera arm and a phone. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. oh Vorpal yeah. board. Now I know which Vorpal one. Board. Vorpal yeah. board. Yeah, exactly. Vorpal board. Vorpal board. Call Vorpal board. boards. One you camera. Grab the window around and move the. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like highlight like, the areas. Yeah. Augmented reality. Primitive. Augmented yeah. Reality. Yeah. It was yeah. pretty cool. It's not enough for me. Right. When you have three cameras. Yeah. Yeah, four is too much. I don't want to. I know, stress... like the Dwarven Forge people were running live games, and like they're doing Kickstarters, multi-million dollar Kickstarters. Yeah, and they're yeah. trying to show what it looks like, and they're trying to do it remote. And they use Vorpal Board so that players could could Absolutely. see the stuff that they're using. So it's, yeah, well, Vorpal Board is is good for because you can do board games and D and D with it. So they really got something right. there. But they just need, I think, they need to expand. And uh, the the uh, the connection if uh, with the more uh, what I've heard is the more individuals you have remotely in it the slower it is because they all have to it all has yeah. to bounce back and forth sure it makes but, sense but yeah. uh there are yeah, what's that uh um Gitano, jay's version of triathlon running around his table dm cardio well that's why i lost the 50 pounds there <laughs> Gitano. so Yay. i don't mind it hey tomorrow night you get to see me play right because the ever mysterious <laughs> tim will be playing a city state tomorrow night so i'm excited yeah, it doesn't happen special. too often we see you play you know not too often, not too often. Here's a st funny story, um, Mike. Uh, Anna and I, uh, along with a couple other people, we had a team in a, in a game called The Big Bad where uh, um, uh -oh. well, yeah. it was 5e and uh, uh, yeah. the Wandering DMs and had a, a tournament. And uh, who else was in it? Uh, Stefan had a team. The Storvin, uh, he had Luke Ajax yeah. on the team. And we had yeah. uh, a Web DM and a bunch of other ones. And we came in dead last. <laughs> yes, we, game. we didn't realize it was a competition until we were like halfway through. So we were like, let's yes. do this carefully and meticulously and play well right. and all that, not yes. just run for the end. So, yeah, well, That's it was funny. fun. We, we, yeah, we freed fun. the guy, but we still yeah. came in dead last. So, uh, yeah. yes, Armin, thank you awesome. for that, uh, for that resub. Yeah. And Armin is a good streamer. And uh, oh my god, Armin, I gotta, I gotta program a shout out for you. He will be <laughs> streaming late nights for Gary Khan for us for Greyhawk yeah. Adventures yeah. in the middle of the night from new zealand so we got that we got two nights covered so armin thank you so very much yeah. for uh, coming on tonight and participating all right so everyone sees behind me i have part of library my li my my j library as anna calls at one point j right i got yeah, my exactly one most j. used book yeah. the classes and races <laughs> book here one along point, with all my supplements one, here two point something uh yeah. 40 years and then this pile which is really hidden Ah, so <laughs> all the books that my guys can grab that I like pull from these first. These are the you know the ones that are all junked up. You know, so <laughs> these aren't the good. These, these aren't, aren't the, the good ones. They're not the sacred texts. Trust me, these are. This is not the. This is not the <laughs> DDs of demigods first print in perfect condition. It's on that shelf that anyone touches. Nice. They're getting. They're. It's a permanent right. ban, right? So right. you're you, out. You, you get it. You're out. <laughs> We've been friends for 40 years. I don't care. Yeah, do not touch you that touch one. It. You're yeah. out. Or or the shrink wrap free city grail box set. Don't touch that or you know, <laughs> yeah, they know. So <laughs> start yep. scanning. Oh, Kitano, I love books in my hand. I know a lot of people yep. love the PDF, but I love the book. And Mike, what do you think? I mean, you're more I, I like both, but I've I I so PDFs for me. I, I I have over a thousand RPG PDFs now um, that I've that I've bought from all yeah. various places, me and it's too. it's because it's like zero friction for me to buy a PDF these sure. days. Um, yep. So like one thing is like I've got a couple of DM Guild adventures that keep me in DM Guild money, and I don't cash out, and I just keep buying all DM Guild stuff as long as I have credit in there. <laughs> and so <laughs> and so yep. it feels like it's free, right? I'm like right. whatever, just you know. Yep. Yep. And um, so I get a lot of stuff. I back, I back hundreds of Kickstarters. I have more than 150 Kickstarters I backed. And most of the time I'm backing at the PDF level. Um, I generally buy the ones I'm going to really use and play. And, and I'll go back and buy them if I end up buying them. And then there's certain publishers where I buy their physical ones because of how good they are. Like Monty Cook Games makes just beautiful books. And I don't play a ton of Numenera, but I love 
the I love Numenera and I love the art in those books. And I really want to have the physical versions of those Cobalt Press. I buy their stuff, you know, uh, as everyone should. And um, yep. so there's there's a lot of stuff. Obviously, the Wizards of the Coast stuff, obviously, I, I buy I buy that. Um, and then there's a few where I will buy the physical, but a lot of times I will get the digital ones um, because it's just zero friction. I don't have to worry. Like I don't have a library. My whole house is filled with this stuff. Right. So like every room in my house, pretty much there's a couple that don't, but like my living room and my dining room and my office and my bedroom, they're all filled with RPG books. Right. And it's like, I don't really organize them. I just sort of let myself put them wherever I feel like I want them, you know, and, okay. and, and, and yeah, so they're all over the place. So I don't have any one, you know, I have, I have so many copies of the core books that I have a separate set of core books in like three different rooms for each edition. No, just for for fifth. Okay, yeah. just for fifth. But I but I have like the full. I think I've got third. I don't think I have second. Okay. But I got I got the uh, the rule cyclopedia, first edition, third and fourth and fifth are all on my bookshelf over over. You can't see it, but right over there. Recently, because Troller Games has been so kind to us, I have been collecting a lot of their uh, Troller Games castles and crusades uh, yeah, modules and yeah. references, and it's fantastic stuff too. I just want to give them a shout out. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're they're a great company as well when it comes to publications. Uh, Monty, both Monty Cook and, and, and Cobalt Press. I mean, we we're lucky to have Sean Reynolds on, Bruce Cordell, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. Wolfgang on recently, and they're just yep. all great uh, companies. Yeah. I've never played Cipher System, so I don't know much oh, about good. it. It's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I really it's I think yeah. it's my I think it's my favorite RPG system. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it has some really cool stuff. Cool. Yeah. With I it. Think, I've played it a few times. Yeah, yeah. I've played it a bunch. I've run I've run I've run it a bunch. And it's the it's the nicest DM system I've used. I've never played long campaigns, so I don't know how it holds up over time. Uh but it's got a lot of really interesting ways that it handles things. Uh, it does a bunch of things that I really dig. It's got theater of the mind as its core use of ranges, which for me is a really nice thing. Uh, it's got a fair bit of character flexibility, so players don't get bored too easily with with just sort of one dimensional characters. Um, the DM hardly ever rolls dice, which is really interesting. That the DM sets challenge sets challenges and the players roll the dice. Okay. Um, so I really dig that. It uses static damage, so you don't have to have giant piles of dice. You can just roll a d twenty and you're good. Um, there's just a lot of things about it. I love that. Like in one of the things that I adore about it is basically every challenge in Numenera or in, in Cipher System is defined by a number. And from that number, you can build an entire monster. So if you want to improvise an NPC, you can generate the entire NPC by asking yourself on a scale of one to 10, how difficult is this NPC? How powerful is this NPC? Where a 10 is like a demigod and a one is like your normal schlub. Okay. And and then you you can generate hit points and attack and you can you generate all the other things you need in order to interact with that NPC from that single number and you can do it all in your head and that just to me is a super powerful you know the fact that you can have rich characters on the player side but then in the DM side you can just refine it down to a number really nails for me the the idea of of being able to quickly improvise things like it's built around the idea of being able to improvise your your games. And, I love that about it. On the fly, right? And uh, yeah. and and the key I've always found to being a good DM is to being able to. It's, I got sound like the freaking Marine Corps now, Anna. You military person, you to be adaptable, <laughs> to adapt and overcome yep. when those situations <laughs> arise. Because oh, yeah, you, you have know, to and adapt that comes up and, a lot. So yeah, yeah. It, uh, yep. there's a lot of times where you need to do that. Yeah, I've I've pulled a whole bunch of DMs on this question of like, what are the most valuable DM traits? And it almost always comes back with uh, creativity, flexibility, and improvisation yeah. which which are really kind of three of the same thing <laughs> i mean yeah i, I think it's the, the 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 rare combination of being able to plan and come up with cool ideas yep. and then adapt them afterwards so to speak yeah, yeah stick sure to them, like what so do you speak. yeah and so come up yeah. with great plans and, and great ideas and stuff yeah. jot them down but they should only be guidelines because once the action yep. starts it, it then you should adapt direction. so to speak yeah. I've, yeah I've really recently i've really been i mean so return of the lazy dungeon master has been has it this way but i've been thinking about it using like the metaphor of cooking and it's like it's the difference between like going into the kitchen and preparing a very detailed meal and the, and your and your your guests are out front and you bring the food to them already and doing like a hibachi grill where they're asking for things and you're flipping stuff around and you're cutting the knives and instead of coming out with the meal you have the ingredients that you put on the table and you're cooking in front of them 
Yeah. You know, and to me, it's like, what are the ingredients you need to be able to cook in front of them during a, during a game? And it's like, I need monsters. I need treasure. I need locations. I need secrets and clues. I need a strong start. You know, I need these yeah. like these little bowls of stuff. And I don't have to build an encounter because the encounters are going to happen on their own. What I need is where is that encounter going to occur? Who's going to yeah. be in that encounter? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and what are they going to learn from that encounter? And I need yeah. those things separate because maybe they face the boss NPC in the main throne room and maybe he's outside, right? Maybe they catch him in the outhouse. So, you know, staying flexible to me means sort of separating these things out that we typically bundle together into what we think of as like a scene, right? Yeah. We're like, we're going to have this scene. It's going to be in this place with these monsters in this, with these environmental effects and this thing. And it's like, yeah, but what if it doesn't? Like, got it. What if they go the other direction, right? And That's like, true. Well. So how That's about true. instead I have five locations and a bunch of monsters and a bunch of NPCs and everything else. So, so that's, that's how I've been thinking about it more and more. And, and I think that that's how the, you know, what, what my, my book talks about too. Okay, we got, uh, we got a real good question out there. Dwayne Costi asks, do you have any plans to market your adventures as modules on roll 20 or other VTTs? Mm -hmm. So no. Uh, and the reason why, so there's a, a few reasons why. Uh, one thing is that we, I make sure that, so, so both for my books, I'm, I'm using the Royal We in some circumstances. There's stuff I've done and then there's stuff that like Scott and James and I are doing for Fantastic Layers. And um, we're making sure that all of the maps are available in VTT compatible formats and try to make it as easy as possible to be able to Important, install them yeah. into yeah. Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds and everything like that. Um, and I think there's a couple of VTTs where basically the VTT company came to me and said, um, hey, you know, we'll do it for you and we'll take a cut of the profit. And like in that case, it's like, sure, that's fine because I don't have to do any work. But the hard part is like, I haven't seen any evidence yet that they sell particularly well. Like first party stuff sells really well. Like, you know, if it's, if it's, Wizards of the Coast D and D material. I know that sells well, but I don't know that like third party stuff does. And it's a ton of work to get them to really work well. And the other thing is, I don't play them on those platforms, so I can't really quality control them. Um, you know, I'm also a one man shop, right? I don't I don't have a staff. I don't have I, I freelance things out, and that's the kind of thing I can freelance out. But like when I've when I've tried to find um, you know the the people to do it, the the costs are high enough. And it's like, I just don't think it's going to make that much back. So yeah. instead, it's like, I would rather try to make the maps. I'd rather try to make the material as easy as possible for you to be able to drop it into a VTT if Makes you're sense. using it, you know, and, and hopefully, I know people want it. Lots of people have asked me for it and I should try it, right? I should pick, pick something and do it. Um, but the problem is like, again, I only have a limited amount of time. Every, everything takes time, right? This is <laughs> only so many hours you know, in a day. Trust yeah, me. Yeah. And there's this yeah. <laughs> starter lesson that like money ain't time, right? Generally right. speaking, money isn't time, uh, in rare circumstances, if it's enough money, it can turn into time because you can, the thing that you're making money on somewhere else you can reduce. But, um, so a lot of times we'll hit something and it's like, I can either try to make VTT versions of my other stuff, or I can work on my new book and I really can't do both. Right. And, and the new book is going to hit a lot of people across every platform. Yeah. So I've tried to hit the things where I think I'm going to be able to help the widest range. And when it's like, well, doing a fantasy grounds version and doing a roll 20 version and doing, you know, now I got to do astral and I got to do foundry and I got to do, you know, there's, there's so many of them and people are fanatically loyal to their VTT. Mm -hmm. That's true. But there's, but there's a lot of them yeah, <laughs> and but they're they all difficult to learn. So and what, you have and to invest 200 hours. That's right. And money, it. right. That yeah. like, yeah, how many, yeah. how much money do people spend on this stuff? Like well, if, they, if you buy all the same amount as buying the books. So yeah, you buy the pretty books. much. Some yeah. cases yeah. more now. I mean, yeah. really. Uh, in some cases know, more. Yeah. yeah. Fantasy right. Grounds is, uh, you know, I'm not bashing them, but they're, those, they have a classic, which, uh, you know, uh, one of uh, my friends, Mike Wilson, Celestian did all the coding for those yeah. books, those ref, all those kit books. They're not, that adds up, right. Especially in the 2E world. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're talking all over the place, JB. You know, we're all over the place tonight, which is good. And that's the way that we like the discussions. You know, we're going to bounce all around here. So, uh. yeah. So just uh, teeing in on the question of uh, they might benefit. The, the question is, I don't think like they might benefit on of, uh, I think I'm just reading the comment. Uh, I think they're wonderful and they might benefit from the wider exposure they receive from Roll 20s, millions of 5e. The problem is that it's not really, it's not millions that come and buy my adventure. <laughs> right? Right. I'd love that. That'd be awesome. Yeah. But a million people never bought it in the PDF format, I can tell you. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, 
from I've talked to people who have done it, and for third party stuff, it's hard to get it's hard to get money back, right? And there there are people I know um, that that spend the time and, and effort and energy to put on a VTT because they they really want to support that VTT as much as they can, and and that's a good strategy for them. And it's just it's it's, it's a part that I have not, you know, I don't know enough about it. I know the costs are high. I don't know that the return is going to be very good. And I've got other things that are sort of grabbing my attention. Yeah, it, it's amazing that good like, question, though. with real life yeah. work and all the other and family and all the other things going on, yeah. there's only so many hours in a day. And, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. it's just it's uh, we do it this because we love to do it. Yeah. And we've talked like Scott and Scott and James and I have talked about doing it for fantastic layers, you know, and, and we're like, well, yeah, we've got. 18 things we got to deliver for the Kickstarter and that ain't one of them. Right. <laughs> it's like, we got a lot of people that are back to Kickstarter. So we really do try to, like we've run the maps and everything else. And it's like, I don't think having used VTT is like, it's not that terribly hard to get the map in there, drop your tokens on it and run. Right. And, and right. have the PDF on the side and, and use it. So I think it's still pretty usable in a VTT. It's not like it doesn't work in a VTT. It's just like, it's not quite as clean as if you bought the module there. Very cool. I got a question for you here. Yeah. So how did this come about? Ready? How did you get an article into Gygax number five? Man, you're uh, Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> it was a long time ago. I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. yeah so. I, I mean, it was long enough ago that you reminded me, but I, I have it on my my dining room table or my 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 living room uh, coffee table. And I remember, like, I was, like, sort of organizing it. And I'm like, what's this doing here? I'm like, oh, I wrote in this. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's, like, like, 10 years ago. It was a like, long time ago. Yeah, I don't, I don't even remember ago, what I wrote like about. That. Do you remember what I wrote uh, about? It was an article, <laughs> about, it was, uh, an article about uh, being a DM, you know, I yeah. believe. Yeah. So so I, I can't I, – I, I don't remember if they reached out to me. Probably they reached out to me because I don't okay. think I was – I wasn't I, – I tended – at that point, I don't think I was – uh, really beating the bushes to try to do a lot of freelance stuff. Okay. Um, and I think they reached out because they, they saw what I wrote and said, if I were to write something, I said, sure. And I was doing other articles like that. I did a few of those for Wolfgang Bauer for the, uh, the, the, the Kobold guides. And, yeah, the, the um, Book of Lairs? Yeah. That's up, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, uh, yeah, so that, that Book of Lairs actually wrote a lair, but I, the, the, Kobold, the Kobold Guides the Kobold and Game Mastery. Quarterly, mastering. and then they had a Game Mastery yeah, Guide. Yeah, so he has all, all that. Yeah, it, yeah the, the Kobold Guides cover that wide range yeah. of world building, mm -hmm. Game Mastery, and all that stuff. And yep. so I think I did about two or three of those for Wolfgang. And um, yeah, and then I did two layers. Uh, Book of Lairs had one, and Eldrick Lairs, I think, was another one. And I did one of those. Um, and then I did a uh, one of his Warlock layers too. So oh, cool. Um, yeah. yeah. So I did a bunch of um, you know stuff like that. And th those things are like that's that's my kind of writing. Like the, you know, there's things that are hard for me to do. Writing adventures is hard. Like writing adventures, writing layers. That I I, re I love doing it, but it's a lot of work for me to really get a good one done. Because it's not what we do as a DM. No, no, it's not, not anything all. like because I'm in the middle of doing one now. Yeah, yeah, for, it's yeah, hard work, journey. and it's yeah. it's just you know, <laughs> getting all like the logic to work right, and you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. How can they get in the room? There's the door's not yeah. big enough. Yeah, and so, there's a lot of little details, and uh, yeah, it's just it's just yeah. and the right there's just the kind of writing, and you're constantly switching between fiction and technical writing back and forth, yeah. and that that does weird things to your brain. Yeah. Uh, but like writing articles about how to DM. Uh, or writing a book like Return. I wrote I wrote all of Return and Lazy Dungeon Master in a week. And it took me a year to get it where I wanted it. But the, the first Flirt. draft was a week. And it's just because it's easy for me to write that stuff. I've been writing those kinds of things for a long time. The chapters are essentially like articles on in, you know, articles on a on a blog, and I've been writing that for a long time. So there's there's types of writing that are really easy for me to do. And I'm not I'm not, you know, I'm not no, but once you, here, but you like, get the workflow and stuff, you have yeah, assets just, you can, I, it, and thinking and all that. Yeah, and I'd love prep. doing it. It's, yeah. it's that flow for me. Like, mm -hmm. that's that's easy. So so articles like the one that's in, in Gygax, um, you know, I, I just, I, I, I love I love doing that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. It really is cool. Yeah, I don't, I wish I, I wish I remembered how that all came about. And, and I, I don't. Hey, <laughs> uh, it's okay. I mean, we used, you know, we've asked some of the other guests some stuff and they go i have no idea so <laughs> well, you're in the same you're the same so realm so stuff. so yeah, so, yeah. yeah. someone yeah. asked me about yeah. a map i did eight years ago i'd be like yeah 
maybe, yeah. maybe <laughs> idea that I did something. Yeah, I mean, so yeah. Bruce Cordell, right? So Bruce Cordell wrote one of the fourth edition adventures that I was running, and I went up to him, and I'm like, hey, this NPC, like, what did you mean? It's like, man, that was like two years ago. I have no idea, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, mm -hmm. we were hammering those out, you know? It's like factory work. Uh, yeah. Uh, he, uh, the prolificness of that's a word of him. It's unbelievable, especially yeah, from Cordell. second edition on. It's yeah. crazy. Uh, so uh, speaking of that, um, you were very prolific in, like, between Dungeon 197 and 209. Yep. I mean, you got, uh, I, no, 192 and 204. I, I, I put the first and the last one up. Okay. You did a, and that is, are these did. all fourth yeah. edition? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the only fifth edition, I think I wrote, so I wrote a couple articles for Dragon Plus when they switched to that digital format. Okay. Um, but generally, my the amount of, of stuff that I did for Wizards of the Coast dried up after fifth edition came out. Um, and sure. I did, I did uh, Vault of the Dracolich with Teo Sabadia and Scott Gray and myself uh, did that. And that was a D&D &D Next. It was originally a D&D &D Next Adventures League adventure. And um, now it's available in the DMs Guild. And I'm, we're, both, we're, all, we're all real proud of that. And that was a wonderful collaboration to do. Um, but yeah, I was, I was, you know, definitely. So, um, and that, that was serendipitous too. Like I, 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 I sort of, um, you know, met the right people at the right time to, uh, you know, Greg, Greg Bilsland was the, one of the producers there and he and I met at a convention and he knew, you know, Greg was a very sort of pragmatic editor, you know, pragmatic, uh, guy who was like, you know, can you write stuff that doesn't look like crap on time? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And, you know, and so I met my deadlines and I wrote stuff that was okay. I had a couple things rejected where they're like, you don't know what you're talking about this. You know, I wrote a whole thing and they were like, I, I, they called him like, I, I don't know. There was some name of some like abyssal demon thing. And I thought like, oh, those sound cool. And I wrote like a whole thing about him. And they're like, no, no, we have, we, we already know what these monsters are, <laughs> you know, and you're, you're didn't write to that. I'm like, I didn't know. I thought you just made those names up. Right. And so I made up stat blocks for him and it turned out I was totally wrong. I'm like, we're going to reject that. I'm like, okay, you pay, I don't care. And um, yeah, so I did a lot of fourth edition stuff. And then probably one of the things I'm most proud of is I have the most powerful fourth edition official published monster uh which was the fourth edition version of cryonax who was one of the oh. last one of the last guys published cryonax is the unsung fifth elemental prince no one no one pays attention to poor cryonax he's the elemental prince of ice and he has two gorilla heads he's, he, he looks a lot like demogorgon isn't he in the fiend folio he's in the, i think he's in the, the fiend folio yep yeah. and i and i and i the used the fiend folio, folio as a model as yeah. a model for that um, and he, I, I try to remember, I think maybe he just has one head. I think he just has one like gorilla head and a bunch of tentacle arms. And the funny thing is he looks so much like Demogorgon that they get confused. Well, let's there find out. They yeah, got it right yeah. here. <laughs> Feel free. Look it up. And, um, so doing a 30, he was a, he was a level 35 solo fourth edition monster. Oh my gosh. And I, I invented a new mechanic, which I called the donut aura. <laughs> and the, do the donut aura was essentially an aura that would surround a boss monster and do terrible, terrible damage. Yeah, there he is. Yeah, hey, hey Cryonax. Um, he would do terrible, terrible damage to anybody in the aura itself. And so you're only the only way you could defeat the donut aura was getting closer to the monster. So then he could punch you in the face. And, and that was the, it, I really wanted this damned if you do, damned if you don't situation where it's like, hey, you can be in the aura and you'll be blind and shredded by ice, or you can get closer to him and so he can grab you with tentacles and punch you in the face, right? And um, it was a way that you, you know, it's a way to create a monster that you couldn't just fly around and shoot with lightning bolts until it was dead. It was, you know, it's just like a Tarask problem, right? Like right. The, the, the worst thing with the Tarask is a pixie with a bow. And... <laughs> You know, yeah. so like the donut aura was a way that like you couldn't hit him if he if you're outside the donut aura, it looks like a black hole of ice, right? Okay. And you're like, well, if I'm gonna fight this guy, I gotta go into the donut aura. Wait, wait, donut aura so I have to ask this question, and I'm yeah. I'm, be, I'm being a little bit of an ass here. No, please. How is the donut circular in fourth edition when fireballs aren't? Uh good question. I don't remember. It was certain, <laughs> it was, if you were so many squares away, yeah, right. Well, I, I was talking about this on my, on my yeah, I know. I was listening today. You yeah, did, about about square. Right, circles and squares, right? Like, like everyone talks about <laughs> this is my big argument. I got into this with my friend Enrique. Enrique Bertrand runs a website called Newbie DM. Uh, he he freelanced for Wizards of the Coast too, and he wrote a bunch of stuff. I think he freelanced for Wizards of the Coast. They certainly worked with him a lot, and uh, really great guy. And he would get on me about like fifth edition is a game meant to be played on a grid, and then I go like, no, it's not. How do you put a circle on a grid? 
right? right? Like fireball is a radius right. and you can't fit a circle on a grid. So the, the donut or was if you, it was actually a donut square. So it was a square <laughs> donut, right? Of course, like a, okay. Yeah. And it was like, if you were, I think it was like, if you were more than 30 to 20 squares out, you know, if you were in that range of, if you were outside of 30 squares, you couldn't see them. If you were 30 to 20 squares out, you were going to get hit by the donut or, and it, you had to be within 20 squares or, or within 10 squares or something like that. But he was really hard and he had boatload, like thousand hit points, you know, nice. crazy powerful guy. Yeah. And I, and I ran him against my level 30 party and, and he gave him what for. So hence he's the strongest monster that they published. That is cool. And I don't think they ever published a CR or a CR 30, a level 35 monster in fourth edition after that. Like, <laughs> I don't think there was anything that was that that was that high level. So. So you made you made a mark in that fourth edition era, and you said yeah, it dried right up a end. little bit at fifth. It was right right at the end, so nobody okay. really paid attention. <laughs> like, <laughs> I seriously doubt anyone actually ran Cryonax other than me when I play tested it. No, that's so. I love I love. But he had a cover. He was on the cover, and he had great art, and yeah, it was yeah. a good time. It's very cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, it when fifth came out, you just you just went more completely i was ready so this is uh this is something interesting i was ready to go to fourth edition when i was playing 3.5 near the end okay and i was ready to go to fifth edition when fourth edition's end was coming about and it wasn't that they i was i was ready to move on at that point like okay. i was already playing pathfinder i was already playing other systems yeah, and it's pathfinder and, yeah and i was yeah, i was sort of ready to move on the the the, the 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 sticky bits of 4e were getting to me i loved it and my my group loved it and everything like that but it was yeah it was so heavy mechanics and battles took forever that, um, you know, I was ready to move to a slimmer system that offered a little bit more flexibility to it. And the funny thing is I do not feel that way about fifth. Like I've been playing fifth now longer than I played fourth. I've been playing it for six years and um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting ready to start a new campaign and I'm like, I have no house rules. Right. I was like, how many, what house rules do I have? I'm like, none. I'm good. I'm good with the books as is. Right. I don't need to change anything. And to me, that's like, I changed everything about third. Like I was like, yeah. you can only use these three books and you can't use this. And in fourth, I said like, you can't use the player's handbook. Like how bad is it when you're like, you know, one that's... of my house rules for fourth edition was no player's handbook. <laughs> you yeah. have to play these, these three books because yeah, that, that's the only ones that they balance system. It. Yeah. How good a system is, how much, how li little I have to house right. rule it. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and to me, like there's a little nitpicky, like I'm the 5e is not perfect, you know, but, um, but the, I don't have a lot of, uh, I, I don't have any, like I tried house rules. I tried a few in my last game and they were fine, but like they actually made it more complicated and they didn't really change it that much. And I'm like, I did them just to try them. I didn't need them. And now I'm like, I'm not going to bother. Like, it's just easy to play default. This is going to be a very interesting indie yeah. conversation because, you know, I'm huge into home rules, <laughs> but then again, a lot you're of fixing, stuff. You're fixing 40 years of design problems. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Myself. Yeah. Right. yeah. So it's a little bit of a different angle on it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, fifth edition is the best edition since second, Geek says, which is really cool. I would argue it's the best edition, period. Okay. But, you know, yeah. but we, won't, we won't go to that okay, argument. I'm not, I'm not saying. I'm, yeah. It's no, my favorite. Because I don't use all of 2E. I don't use all of Tui. There's things I yeah. hate in Tui. I hate. I. I don't. I will never have an invoker or a diviner spellcaster <laughs> in my life. But I'll have an elementalist. I'll have a wild mage. Yeah. Uh, I know. have a. Yeah, I have a very fun like a, a memory. I, I, a good friend of mine uh, who we've been, <laughs> been playing with for like 15 years, and he. Uh, so he was the one that like I'm going to show you that the player's handbook in third edition is broken, and he made like a chain wielding half orc barbarian that just shredded monsters, and. Um, I remember he was talking about his experience with second edition and he said, here I am, I go to a table and I got my player's handbook and I make a fighter and it's like my turn and my fighter goes up and he hits the guy with a sword. And then like this next guy goes up and he pulls out his twin scimitars and he does three attacks, two attacks with one hand and three attacks with the other hand. And he's like, and he does all this stuff. And it was because the guy had the complete fighter book. And it's like, you know, the, when you add the complete fighter handbook to second edition, it just goes gonzo, right? And yeah, like the, well, that's true. If the you difference start, between a yeah. fighter from the core book and the fighter from the that book oh, yeah. are like oh, insanely yeah. different. Kits, kits, yeah. kits can really, uh, kits, and that's yeah. where I take <laughs> kits. And uh, real quick uh, for anyone new, yeah. I take kits, I take specialty classes, and I convert them back to a one e two e class with special Inter abilities. Yeah, okay, sure, right? Because uh, yeah, the kits can go if you if you don't have control of your game, then it, <laughs> right. it, get, it goes it goes. And so crazy. there's a big yeah, yeah. I don't know if you, I don't know how much you follow the, the what's going on in fifth edition, but like Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is sort of the newest player 
app driven book that came out for fifth. Yeah. And one of the things they did in there is they offered these sort of uh, replacement options for a lot of the class features. So, you know, as a fighter, you can sort of swap a thing out, but in a couple of cases, they add like a new feature to a class. So the rogue, for example, now has a feature called aim where along with their other cunning actions for like dashing and hiding, uh, they and disengaging they can now also aim which gives them advantage on their next attack they can roll 2d20 and take the better and that's like a that's an improvement and it felt to me like like the complete fighter's handbook because now it's like a tasha's rogue is way better than a non-tasha's rogue yeah and and is that going to be a problem and on one side you're like it's not really that big a deal like it's one little thing it's not you know it's it, your, your character isn't 210 percent better than the original yeah. you know but you're <laughs> 10 or 15 percent better right it's definitely yeah. a but, you know but my getting that sneak attack with a range weapon still drives me insane but then again that's just an addition <laughs> difference yeah. right and, so. and actually the aim yeah to pick on aim the the thing that aim does aim does a little bit of what we were talking about with fourth edition which it, aim fixes bad dms so the problem is that a rogue should really be able to sneak every round and get an advantage on their target anyway, as long as they can find some kind of cover to do it. But DMs are jerks sometimes, and DMs will say, no, there's no, you can't do that. You can't hide anywhere. Even though the intent was that they should be able to. It doesn't yeah. say that the intent was, so the DM right. thinks they're cheating, and they're not. So they get aim, and they're like, aim, you just get it, right? <laughs> like, aim, you, you cannot move, but you get advantage on your next attack, which means yeah. that you get advantage, and you can shoot, and you don't have to worry if there's a target next to it, and you can get your sneak attack damage on it. And it, it's just a way of simplifying the rogue a little bit to let it do what it was meant to do in the first place. Like, rogues only ever get one attack. Fighters are hitting there four times, you know, and then the rogue gets that one shot. So that one shot with advantage that like gets sneak attack is 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 pretty, you know, it's fine. But it feels like it was there just to kind of make up for the fact that DMs didn't really know how to handle the cunning action of, a good of, point. of sneak. Yeah. 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 And, and not, once not again. Not to get all nitpicky. Oh, no, it's good. It, it, this is a great, <laughs> great discussion point. So you said, I knew we were going to jump all over the one place. One day soon really we're going to cool. talk about books. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Mike's got a top five. I think yeah. I got them all. I think I th is, is there actually five or is it four? I think I, I, I put top five and then. Well, I one of them is like four. a pamphlet, I think, from uh, someone. Yeah, okay. Here. So there's five. All yeah. right. So let me get to them here, yeah. and let's, uh, and then I'll, I'll throw out some that I, uh, I love, and I've been scrolling through a bunch of them, uh, and then uh, maybe Anna will jump in as well with uh, yeah. one or two that she has, and let me just see where we are here. Okay, that's all. Hey, can I, can I take a uh, like a minute break? Absolutely. I'll be Absolutely. right back. Absolutely. Then I should grab one of my books here. Yeah, I grab one of your books favorite. here too. And I'm going because yep. I'm, I'm setting this as an update here. And I'll be I'll be in. talking while Mike is off. Um, uh, let's talk about some things real quick. Hey, what's up there, Naz? What's up there, this is Tim? Funny. I'm not even sure I have it in in physical form. I might only have the PDF. <laughs> Okay. Yep. I might so, not even have uh, bought it. Armin, if you're, I, I miss what Armin's. T I, I think the rogues are proud to mention some Reddit was flame troll. Wow. Yeah. Um. I, I'm so happy I don't have to get into the five E arguments on Reddit and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. I, absolutely. Oh, thanks, sir, Patrick. Thanks to. Um, thank you so very much, man. I haven't heard from you tonight. I guess you're lurking away tonight, there, Canadian. Um. Everyone knows about uh, Virtual Grey Con, I hope, okay? And uh, yeah, just note so. that I have only four open stream slots left for, for, wow. for well, to have full coverage. And Armin yeah. was nice enough to cover from New Zealand the night ones on, on Wednesday. Um, sorry, back. Thursday night and Friday night. We still have late Saturday night. We have two 6 a.m. slots uh, in the morning, and I have one that I think Chuck will be uh, covering as well. And thank you, El Naval, for that as, uh, as well. So, uh, But we'll talk about it at the end of the, of the show. Uh, um, so I have your first here. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, you know, I like my uh, Legend of the Seeker uh, uh, GIFs, as you can see. So, sorry. <laughs> I lo love that show. And uh, so you may see them popping up a lot in, uh, in uh, announcements. But a complete Kobold Guide to Game Design. Yeah. So yes. uh, this, is, uh, this is your favorite go-to? I know it's a top five. I, I, so it's in my top five. I don't think I put them in order. But I okay. do. So I don't, I, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to rank them against one another. Okay. Um, but I, I think it's an outstanding book for a few reasons. Um, it is a sort of revised version of a bunch of essays with some new essays in it 
uh, that talk about game design for, for RPGs. And a, a lot of the advice in it, this, it's an interesting thing with a lot of these books um, is that they, they sort of dance between things that are good for dungeon masters and things that are good for publishers in, our, in the world of RPGs. And there's, there's a, you know, it's a, fun, a Venn diagram with a fair bit of overlap. Uh, and a lot of the uh, essays that you find in this uh, can, can work both for DMs and for uh, publishers. And what I like about it is that the people that they got to write for it are real long-term career people. Like, you know, again, Keith Baker, Wolfgang Bauer, Monty Cook, Ed Greenwood, Rob Hainso, Jeff Grubb. You know, there's big just names, big monster names. names. And I did manage to slide in there. So Mike Shea has an essay. That's <laughs> awesome. But, um, yeah. you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, a small person among titans in this book because it's just, it's really great to be able to talk to like, you know, Wolfgang Bauer, who's been the editor of Dragon, you know, Dun Dungeon and Dragon magazine, right? For yeah. a long time. Anna, Anna does work for Wolfgang right now. I know, so. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, time. Yep. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but awesome. to be able to, you know, I, I don't think there's enough opportunity to squeeze his head to really get some of the, the I, deep yeah. thoughts that, that he's got about how this industry works. And it's yeah. like yeah. a lot of us are monkeying around trying stuff yeah. that he figured out didn't work back, That's, you know, in the 90s. So, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the biggest privilege when you work in the industry yeah. is that you get to spend a day or two. Yeah. Like I spent a day with Wolfgang and Bauer and, and Jeff Grubb. We walked yep. around and, and just sat yeah. down and babbled for awesome. all day. Right. That was awesome. Right. Yeah. So this is, you know, getting a book of essays from these people to get, to get their thoughts about these topics that they wrote about is, is just a really, it's a good experience. And it's a cheap, you know, it, it, it's on sale regularly. I think it's 15 bucks right now on drive through um, I actually bought the, the physical version. I think if you go to Cobalt, the Cobalt Press's site. Uh, I think you can get the print and PDF for pretty cheap. I ended up buying print versions of all of these. Okay. We were talking about PDFs and print. And that's one where I bought print versions because they're these nice booklet-sized books um, that are just great to put on a bookshelf and pull up and just read, a, read an essay. You know, And it's just, to me, being able to tap into someone's mind like that, to be able to get information directly from Monty Cook's brain into mine is a, is a thing that we, we don't always get. And a book like that really you know, really hits the nail on the head with stuff like that. Awesome. Uh, I've never read it. I, I need to pick it up. Oh, yeah. That's an it absolute definitely. definite. Good stuff. I, I, yep. Something I, um, I, and this is one of the reasons I want to, I want to really get into uh, what, what you see as useful things that can help me, that can help everyone else in here. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, probably one of the best times of my life was I took a sabbatical from my job for a month to write Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. And I would, and I, I sort of got everything ready before the month started. And I would go to a coffee shop and I would write, sorry. Uh, I would go to a coffee shop and I would write a chapter of the book in the morning. And then all afternoon, I would just read every book I could find about DMing. And I read tons of them. And, you know, the bibliography in the back of Return has a bunch of the books that you see here, too. I, I, I scoured that when I was making this list. And it was just a delight to be able to read essays by all of these people about all this stuff. And some of it was terrible advice, like not, not, these, not the stuff in these books, but like there's stuff I read where I'm like, that's terrible advice. <laughs> you know? It's very sort of, there are a couple books that are just egocentric books. They're books about the person. They're not books about the industry and they're not books about DMing. They're, they're books by people who want to talk about themselves and think that their ideas are the only good ones. And they didn't do any research. And so it's really great to, um, you know, that was, that was just, it, it was the best, you know, like I said, like, First time in 20 years I'd taken serious time off from work, and it was just great to be able to just spend all day diving into this into this topic. That's super cool. So Gribbly just put, what would you say to who there was no such thing as lazy DM? I think the, the point that uh, Mike's You're trying wrong. to make is, 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 <laughs> is <laughs> well, I mean, there could be, but it, yeah, it's still no, hard work. There's, there's, yeah. uh, it's working smart. Yeah. And, you know, there are, Right. Like the, the other thing is like, you know, it, it's stressful. Like I've run, I've run like a thousand games. Right. And it still stresses me out when I've got a game to run. They're like, am I going to screw up? And am I going to miss an important plot? 
Um, yeah. And Gribbley says, I've never felt lazy after good sessions. That's probably true. Like I'm on all cylinders. I was talking to my wife about it, about like, why, why do I like DMing? Why do DMs like the DM? And I'm like, for me, it's like, I'm doing all of the things that are important in my life at one, in one place. I'm being creative. I'm with my friends. I'm with my loved ones. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm in flow. Like I, all my cylinders are going, I'm moving cameras back and forth. I'm changing spotlights. I'm reading people and I'm putting stuff out. I'm creating, and it's just, it's such this raw energy of creation. And it isn't like, yeah, I'm pretty tired after I'm done. I need to, I need yeah. a break. <laughs> you know, so I guess in that sense, it's not lazy. I guess the prep part, you know, yeah. lazy isn't unprepared. You know, lazy is minimum amount of effort for the maximum gain. And, and I think you can, you know, that, that's kind of what I'm, that's kind of what I'm aiming for. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm going to go to this book that's this ancient, this dungeon. We talked about this on your show. How oh, yeah. There's stuff all over the place yep. in this book. Yep. And if you were to start as a DM in the 70s and read this first, you're gonna your brain's going to explode. No idea. Bell what curves all the way. Like, what the hell is this? <laughs> right? But I had a situation occur, and Bill's on, right, Bill, uh, where the potion missability table came into play because someone forgot and they drank two potions <laughs> and there is that wonderful potion missability table. Yeah. All right. And uh, could have had an explosion, but I remember that the effects, uh, they got a real good effect where it was like 150% duration and effect in it. Uh, but it has great things in here like that. It also yeah. has the aging tables, which I don't know what happened to them in fourth. Did they even worry about if you're old or middle yeah. age anymore? Yeah. They don't, but see, in, in old school, they do, and yeah, the, you know right. they're in here. Uh, the uh, all the different types of diseases are in this book. I mean, really oh my, cool. Yeah, the cool the things. aging thing is a fun one. In a in a recent R. A. Salvador book, one of the many Drizzt books, um, one of the most evil characters, uh, Evenel Banre, who is the leader of yeah. uh, House Banre and the leader of Mensa Baranzen, uh, res was resurrected into the into a child, and yet had all she was sort of like. Um, uh, Alia from Dune. She had all the memories that she had previously. A mind flare put all the memories into her body, even though she's this young girl. And she ends up, she goes into Gomf Ban Ray's tower and then comes out as this beautiful elven woman who's like in her 30s or whatever, whatever you know, age a, a, a drow is, is, is mature. And she comes out and like, what'd you do? And he, she says, he cast haste on me a whole bunch. <laughs> right and i love that idea of like you know the one be detriment to first edition haste yeah one year age a year and she's like bang 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 yeah, now you're 30 <laughs> right? yeah so um i yeah. thought that i thought that was a really creative way of like using the using an old school spell but haste doesn't do that anymore you know like interesting edition, it doesn't fifth edition haste doesn't i don't okay. think it increases your age yeah and so I, i'm i'm almost sure it doesn't it's never come up in my yeah, so that this book of mine, uh, you know, there's there's times to go back into it, and uh, there's some things that are like the potion missability table. I think is a wonderful thing. Uh, there's no you can take as many. There's no effect of taking multiple potions one after another anymore. Correct? Or does that uh, not affect? Is. Because yeah. no, there the is new, okay. The new Dungeon Master's Guide has a. Uh, uh, has a thing about taking multiple potions and craziness that happens to you. Okay. Yeah, it does. It, have it that. is in there. Okay. There's yeah the fifth this is something I, I preach a lot too about the, for fifth edition folks is that like man people people do not pay a lot of attention to dungeon master's guide and there's a ton of stuff in here um it's got there's so many times where people are like hey I came up with a house rule and you're like actually that's not that's, a house rule that's right in there <laughs> you know, yeah that's in the book right um one thing that's in the first edition dungeon master's guide that isn't in any of the fifth edition stuff and it's one of my favorite tables is the monster, the, 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 the random dungeon, mon random monsters in a dungeon by level. Yeah. It's and it's got this really cool mechanics. matrix of what level of the dungeon you're on, roll a 20, and then it gives you like a, which table do you roll on? Yeah, all this back here. Yeah, yeah. that's on page uh, 174. Yeah. And then like, you know, and, and so I actually, in, in, in the Lazy Dungeon Master's workbook, which I have somewhere around here, uh, I recreated that because there isn't a fifth edition one. And so if you look in return, if you look in the Lazy Dungeon Master's workbook, uh, there is a very similar guide for random monsters by level. Oh, cool. That's, that's designed exactly Just the like same way. Just like that matrix right there. Just oh. like that matrix where you have the yeah, dungeon okay. level okay. and you roll and it's all SRD based. So they're all SRD monsters. And, and I, this is one of the tables in my own book that I use all the time because it's a really handy way sometimes to be like, I just need to challenge three monster. 
what are 20 challenge three monsters and they're and they are they're monsters that are like the, the sort of old school random weird monsters you'd find in a dungeon not necessarily the monsters that would have a deep ecology or anything like that so yeah that's something in the dmg i really the original first edition dmg that i, I makes me very nostalgic for for old school D D. If it's not rude for me to call it old school D and D, no, we call it. Old, <laughs> trust me, uh, my old streams. Yeah. I say old school Greyhawk one e two e. I mean, that's yeah. exactly what I put there, just because I want everyone to know that that's uh, yeah. you know that's what we yeah. do here, and uh, yeah. there are not very many of us out there streaming. Uh, Gargaman, who rated in earlier, he's a two e guy. Mike yeah. uh, Mike Celestian's a two e guy. Uh, Tim Tim does one e with me, and uh, Carlos Lysing's one e all the way. But uh, you know, there's not many more beyond that. If I miss someone, I apologize. Yeah. Um, but there's some three fivers. Blue box is three five. Uh, most of it, it's fifth edition. I don't know if there's any four E's out there. And there's a few pathfinders. So, yeah. um, you know, yeah. um, but there, it's all over the place. So, uh, put him on the spot with a hard question. Give us the top of your head one. What? Put him on the spot with the hard, with the hard question. Give us off on the, the top of your head one shot plot hook. Oh, two bandits in the woods. Um, this is my new favorite scene okay. to run. And the, 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 what I love about it is like, no matter what level your characters are, having them wandering through the woods and they run into two bandits that don't notice them. And the bandits can be talking about stuff and the characters get to decide how they're gonna interact with them. And it's, do you go up and kill them? Cause you easily can most of the time, it's two bandits. Uh, do you listen to them and hear what secrets they have to spill? Do you pretend to be someone else and try to you know show them that you're actually time cops? Uh, do you, um, uh, you know, do you sneak around them? You know, do you jack them and take their stuff and try to pretend you're bandits themselves? It's this really cool encounter that doesn't have a set outcome, that doesn't, you know, it's not a combat scene, right? And, and it's really funny to see like five 12th level characters spend like 30 minutes talking about what they're going to do with the two bandits, right? And it's just, it's a really fun hook. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's just, it's a, it's one you can keep in your back pocket and like, and, and it could be two, um, you know, two Sahuigan in an underwater tunnel instead of two bandits in the woods, right? It's, it's just pick two monsters that are low level that are usually humanoid so they can talk and you can, you can dick with them, but you know, it's just a fun, it's quick encounter you can keep in your pocket and pull out yeah. at any time to watch players react to it. So I don't know if that counts as a plot hook. Oh yeah, sure it does. Yeah, but, yeah. Definitely. That 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 yep. to me is a, that that's like a default one for me. It's just so much fun. Mm -hmm. It also gets a thing an important thing for for DMs, which is don't try to balance encounters to the characters all the time, right? Like letting them fight lots of little dudes is so much fun, and 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 the world just like the world doesn't. You know, we a lot of times when DMs say like, well, the world doesn't conform to the char the level of the characters. We're thinking ancient red dragons versus level two characters. We're not thinking about two bandits in the woods for five level 12 characters. But if you think about the power series of powerful monsters, there are very few ancient red dragons and there's a whole lot of bandits. So you're a lot more likely to run right. into a bandit than you are a red dragon at any given level, regardless of the, yep. regardless of the level, unless you're in hell. If you're in hell, there's a lot of battle. <laughs> yeah. Right? So like, or you know, if you're in the abyss, there's a lot of battle. Hours. So I, um, I don't get the challenge. Why challenge rating so important in five E? That's one thing I don't get. I've never, I never used it. It's like a feel. It's a gut feel yes. for me. You know? Yes. Yeah. I've got a tr dirty trick. Uh, I've spoken sure. about it a lot. I did a YouTube video about this too. Um, so challenge rating in five E is a mess. It's one of the things where, so to me, there's like it's probably the biggest for me anyway. I, I, I you know, I, it feels like the biggest miss in five E is challenge rating and encounter design. That just does not work well. The DMG has guidelines. They're ridiculous. The guidelines are like old school 1E, weird ass guidelines that no one can actually understand. Um, and we need like online tools like Kobold Fight Club or the D and D Encounter Builder on Drive on D on uh, D and D Beyond. And they made it better in Xanathar's, but it's like it's this weird ass two dial system to try to figure out like how many monsters you know is going to be a medium or hard fight. And um, and it's because like challenge rating for a monster isn't really anything like it isn't a you know challenge right. rating doesn't define anything in particular it's not a comparison to something it's it's kind of the rough equivalent of four characters of that level so if a cr4 monster is kind of equivalent to four level four characters but not really because the action economy is off 
So like it, it just doesn't make sense when you're, when you're trying to work these dials. Um, so my dirty trick is um, that you only need to worry about whether or not a fight is going to be deadly. Otherwise, you just wing it, right? And if you're winging the fight and you, you base it on the story, how many do I expect would be there based on the ecology and based on the situation, based on the story? And then it's like, am I going to kill him or not, right? And, and instead of worrying about perfect balance, you only worry about a thing that I call the deadly, the deadly encounter threshold. Uh, and the way you figure out the, the deadly threshold of 5e is you add up all of the potential monster challenge ratings that could appear in a battle. And if that number is greater than half the character levels of all of the added character levels, then it's potentially deadly. Okay. And greater than the, half. Greater than half. So, you know, it, so basically the threshold is add all the character levels together and divide by two. And that's your threshold. And then if you look at all the monsters you're throwing in, do the total monster CRs, are they greater than that number? And if they are, then you may be deadly. Doesn't mean don't do it. It just means maybe you better watch out, right? You, you know, have, have a fail forward in mind or you're going to TPK, maybe. And a lot of times it's not because it turns out that characters are really powerful anyway and they can, they can take on more stuff than that. But it's, it's about the simple, like I've spent so much time thinking about the math behind encounter building in 5e and that is the simplest equation I can okay. come up with. Yeah. Um, the, the only thing I use is challenge rating and in Pathfinder 2e that I'm using now, it's called level. But yeah, it's they have level in Pathfinder, thing. yeah. But, but the only thing I'm using it is if I want two monsters or NPCs to fight each other. Oh, interesting. Then yeah. I just use that as a simple number for attack roll, for defense roll, for oh, armor yeah. class hit points, that. whatever, yeah. because yeah. that way I don't have to look through all the whatever. I can so just illustrate yeah. it and just do it quickly. I can have a That's fight actually quickly. like that cipher system, right? Yeah. It's sort of like that. We just yep. pick a number and, and that number yep. is all the all the things. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I, I wish... took that yeah, yeah idea from from I had a simple simpler similar idea, but then when I played Cipher System, I realized oh I can use it the whole way. Yeah, so, so the, so the I math got inspired. So yeah, yeah, the math for fifth edition doesn't quite work like that because it's it's got this sort of it's flat in some areas and not flat in others. Yeah. So you can't just use yeah. there's there's some pretty simple equations you could build a challenge rating on like yeah. AC is roughly you know 10, 10 plus the half the challenge rating, yeah. but but you have to have everything because it's a flatter curve. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's some pretty simple equations to build like a challenge and a, a challenging thing, whether it's a trap or an yeah. monster. But, but it's not quite that, as simple as just rolling against challenge level. Yeah. But you can use that simple when you have two monsters fighting each other and the characters aren't involved. Oh yeah, they yeah, yeah. Just see sure. it at a distance. Yeah. That no, way you can point. run large battles with yeah. a super simple meaning. Yeah, you have yeah, to, yeah. No, that makes a sense. dragon fighting a bunch of, of, of people over there. If the right. characters end up in a mil, in a big battle, so to speak, right. and you have hundreds right. of stuff, you can just aggregate. Them quickly, together and say quickly, 50 orcs yeah. play fighting that dragon and you can kind of play it out and things are happening and, and so on for the characters to watch yeah yeah no, that's a good idea that i have sense. a question i'm going to tie it into a question that uh, jb garrison asked here and this is uh, um on a previous show of yours you are a big proponent of monster average damage yes Ooh. okay love yes. it okay does it's that the affect default in fifth edition what's that it's the default. It's the default. It's the yeah. Rolling how the is damage a, is optional. Okay. Is that a TP? Uh, all right. How do you handle a T, TPKs? And does that assist, or is it it's, doesn't matter for a TPK situation? It it's makes probably it, less likely to be a TPK. Less likely. Okay. It's not so yeah. spiky. Yeah. How, you know and, what yeah. it's going to be. Okay. And how the do only you the only TPK element is, and this is sort of a Mike Shea cheat, is I use static monster damage and I double their crits, and okay. that you means they're double. actually doing a little bit more damage than they would. Uh, if I was doing crits correctly. But I don't mind having dangerous monsters. I crit on one of my characters today and I did 63 points of damage in one shot. And it okay. was like, boy, that got everyone's attention. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, so you double, monsters. you double the crit that you double the crit I, I damage. double the static damage. The static damage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So like, okay. uh, yeah. And, okay. and, and, and for, in fifth, you're not supposed to double the modifier. You're only supposed to double the dice. So I'm actually doubling the modifier as well. Which makes it a little bit more dangerous. Not usually not tremendously dangerous, but they're getting like an extra three or four points. Have you had any? But TPKs? it's super fast. Any TPKs in the last ten years? I'm sure I have, but I can't count them on one hand. Okay. Like I can't. I you know I I I, I very few. If, same I don't here. know that I've ever had a TPK. I don't know. Same, same I, I here. Very few for me. Very yeah. few. I have. And, and the funny I, thing is, like, you can fudge so much stuff. You just don't have to yeah. fudge like attack rolls. You know, there's so many other ways to fudge a game right. and, yeah. and, and steer it than, than cheating on attack rolls. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. 
All right, so let's um, – one more was question. That your question about, was that your question about static damage? Well, yeah, because well, yeah, I was just – I will do a static damage. Like, say I got to roll nine die six, yeah, and sure. I'll do nine times three point five, just yeah. because I don't, you know, or something. Uh, yeah. Even though I have yeah. the dice for like a fireball or whatever, uh, yeah. in certain instances. But a lot, of, I usually my guys like to roll it out, especially massive yeah. criticals and things like that, because we we like, do crits and fumbles. Thirty one, is that right for? Very close, thirty-two. I think thirty-two. Yeah, yeah, it's very close to that. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. It's right Depending there. If you're rounding up or rounding down. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but uh, we, I'll do that on occasion, just yeah. if we want to keep things. moving. I'm getting really good at being able to figure out average damage for dice rolls. <laughs> I've got a, I can now do that in my head pretty well. Sometimes you just need to do that just to keep things moving along. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so here's um. I uh, I just passed what we uh, the second one that's uh, Hamlet's hit points. Yeah, Hamlet's hit points by Robin Laws. Okay. Uh, so Hamlet's hit points. It's a it's a sh it's a small book, and it actually the the parts that are most important are covered in like the first three pages. Um, but it's a but it's a real good one. So he's talking about pacing in drama and how that applies to RPGs, and in particular his 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 general philosophy in this book is that people get excited by ups and downs, that you want to oscillate good things and bad things, upward beats and downward beats. Uh, you want good things to happen and bad things and good things and bad things and good things and bad things. If you have too many bad things in a row, people start to feel hopeless, right? It's, it's, it's hopeless and it's frustrating. Okay. And if you have too many good things, it becomes boring, right? It's too easy and it's too boring. So you want to, and, and he, he, in the book, he's looking at, he takes a bunch, I think three different, he takes uh, Hamlet, Casablanca, and Dr. No, uh, <laughs> and he shows what the upward beats and downward beats are for each of those uh, uh, movies, for you know, a play in two movies, and then also defines the kind of beats. And I got lost on the kind of beats. I couldn't tell you what they are. But the idea of, of thinking about your upward and downward beats and oscillating between them is a good one. And so the, it's the kind of thing where like, if you've got characters that are going through a dungeon and if, if they hit a trap... And the trap, you know, they, they screw up and they step on a plate and darts hit them and they're poisoned and now they got to deal with that. And then they get attacked by specters who throw through the walls and drain their levels. And then they go further on and, and you know, another door with another trap and they fail that one and they're hit by a fireball. It's just like, oh my God, I hate this place, right? So then like as a DM, you, you want to have some back pocket upward and downward beats. Where like if they if they if they find the trap and they're you know in five E vernacular they use their passive perception and they see it right away without having to roll and then they they go oh I I I sense danger there's something weird here let's investigate it they do investigation they nail it they're like oh this is really great they figure out the trap they get around it now the trap became an upward beat so you don't know while you're playing whether it's going to be an upward or downward beat so you want to keep other upward and downward beats in your back pocket like you are attacked by specters and it's more than a we originally planned because you had such an easy time with the thing before. Makes um, sense. Yeah. yeah. And then, but sometimes you need an upward beat, like the, yeah, you, you're hit by the trap or anything else. The wall collapses next to you and you find out there is a healing fountain in there that had been buried in this dungeon for 300 years. And you found it because you fell through the wall and now you can drink from it and you get some hit points back and you restore some stuff. So, you know, you, you want to have those, like one of the things that you want to have prepared are ways to steer things up or steer things down to keep that pacing so that that book was one that really um you know kind of nailed a, a an, an easy to understand concept for how to handle pacing and Mon monty cook said in, in in books that he's written i think he said this in um weird weird discoveries a book for numenera but he said that the, the most important dm trait is understanding pacing uh, I don't know if I would say it's the most important because, again, everyone else thinks that being able to improv easily is good pacing or is good DM skill. But that, like, understanding how to pace something so that you're keeping the action there, but you're not overdoing it. Yeah. And and this was a practical way to do that. So that's why I like this. That's why I like this book. Very cool. In a miniatures game, and I don't know if any my guys know this, but I'll have – 12 uh, say i have 12 ghouls behind my screen but i'm only planning on using six if if things are pacing it properly 
maybe they're going real quick and I need to add in some, take some away, whatever. You just have to have the flexibility, for, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. You need to also, we have what's called wandering damage, right? <laughs> Sometimes the DM needs to inflict some wandering damage, whether it's, you know, whatever that is. Yeah. Whatever that is. And uh, the best one always is, and uh, Scott Casper, if you know Scott, he, he was, he, the first time he played in, Scott is a kick door kick down person, no matter what. And my guys will remember this. He just ran up, boom, kicked the door down. Those doors didn't have traps. Right. <laughs> they did every time Scott ran up oh, and no. just knocked the door down, <laughs> right? And so you have to do that kind of stuff sometimes. Right. You know, with reckless, if people are going to play with reckless abandon, they got to, you know, you got to, you got to set them up, you know. Man, I don't know. Those people are like gold for me because they keep the story going. So sometimes, yeah. I wanna, sometimes I reward them. But it's more than once, uh, 5e has this idea of inspiration, right? Like, like yep. your hero point system. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I will often give a deal of like, you know, do you want to do this clearly risky thing? I'll give you a hero point for doing it, you know? And they're like, that's almost never worth it, but sure. Right. And they, yep. So you're oh, bargaining absolutely. with them. But most of the time, I love them because they move the story forward. They're not the ones that are going to spend like 20 minutes figuring out the exact right tactical position to get into before kicking in the door. They're the ones that are moving the story. So I want to, I, I try not to beat them too hard. Very cool. You want to beat them enough that. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, 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 my guys, my rookie, Bill, the master crafter, has been with me since 92. Yeah. So and, uh, Alan goes back to 78, Tim Walt to 80, you know. They yeah. know all that my tricks, so yeah. you know we yeah. got we have a friendly but you know little relationship but, there with stuff. But yeah, then I with the new players and like you and Casey yeah. and all the uh, Living Greyhawk people, I yeah. get the and and Mike. W w I think that your pacing comment is is spot on, but I also think that it's important to think about pacing during combat and encounters yep. too. So yep. because otherwise you get that like hit and roll damage, but you yep. need to kind of get out of that yep. rhythm at times. So so don't show all the cards that the same at the beginning of the fight mm -hmm. I meaning have mm -hmm. things enter into it fight and then have an enemy do something that is out of the fight for yeah. a round thinking about or, something or, yeah. yelling for someone or or or, or just doing yeah. something that is more story driven into the combat every or round critical or two, critical the, fumbles right exactly the, the, there should the be the enemy exactly sword some, shatters on the yeah, shield and they're like exactly holding a something yeah. that or something falls down all of a sudden right. someone <laughs> knocks into it and something happened in the environment something to right. to get the the out of the mechanic and into the yep. story again, yep. so to speak, yep. Yep. during combat. I think that's really important. Yeah, I agree. All right, so let's do one of my go-tos. This is a mix of a rule book and reference book. And we had Jim yeah. Ward on the show, and what a pleasure that was a few months back. And this is the Greyhawk Adventures book for, by Jim Ward. Uh, wow. Great references in here. Uh, great spells, which we're going to discuss some of them on our Wednesday Night Legends of Lore. Um a lot of locations uh and he told us that they were so rushed this thing got put together in three months which is unbelievable <laughs> and and the story behind that but uh so i i say this is one of the go-to references if you are a greyhawk person you got to have this book whether it's in pdf or hard copy whether you have from the ashes or whether you have all the others no matter what edition you play you really need to get a hold of this for greyhawk what do you think anna oh yeah definitely yeah yeah definitely a go-to book for well you're us. you're you're making me spend 10 bucks right now <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's gone there you go uh, what a <laughs> great i mean joe and jim, jim's such a pleasure to have and we we heard his stories about metamorphosis alpha and oh by the way mike i don't know if you know this the word monty hall dm yeah is Jim Ward was called that by Gary Gygax. That's really? where it started. Yes. <laughs> we heard the story about how he called him a yep. Monty Hall DM. And, oh, uh, yep. Learn. Yeah, that was one of the cool little tidbits we, huh. we got back then. Let me go to your next one here. Uh, and this one is like more of a, this is from Goodman Games. How to write adventures that don't suck. Yeah. <laughs> I yes. love the name of that. <laughs> yes. And uh, it was a, when I, 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 uh, when I was writing Ruins of the Grendel Root, I wanted to write adventures that didn't suck. And uh, I was collecting a bunch of advice, again, reading a lot of the Kobold guides, which, which hit on this, and a lot of advice articles. And uh, this was one, it's a, it's a short two-page bullet list by, by Joseph Goodman uh, for Gen Con in 2007 uh, that just lists, it's a really nice, concise list of ways to write adventures that don't suck okay. and i really liked it as a not not almost not quite a checklist 
but um, but pretty close to one where you could sort of read this and figure out uh, you know figure out how to do things. And there's 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 quite a few areas where this and um, Janelle Jaquay's uh, designs for maps uh, sort of overlap. That's something else ah. that I'd only recently kind of gotten into. You know, sort of a a new thing. Uh, uh, Justin Alexander wrote an article called uh, Jaquaying the Dungeon about how Janelle Jaquay's dungeons of old um, really Dark had Tower. To, yeah, well, like Dark Tower. On my wall of fame. Things. What yeah, a great yeah. adventure. Uh, and and there's a lot of that idea of like, you know, show show things before they can get through it. You know, like show a big door that they can't get through yet. And now they know that there's that door and then they get excited when they're able to open it later. Little little tricks like that. Um so I, yeah, I really like this list because it's really concise. There's a longer version of this that is like another book of essays, which is also really good. But I like this one a little better because, just because it's two pages. It's really digestible. It's just an available in PDF for people to it's, get. Like, yeah, this is available for free from Goodman Games. Okay, there you go. Um, so yeah, that that link that's there is the full thing. Okay. Uh, and it's from Goodman Games, and it's their sort of this was this was sort of the essay that they wrote that that then spawned the larger. Thank you, um, Katana, for linking book. that. You were awesome. Yeah, Beautiful. the larger book uh, of it. But I just, I just feel like there's a lot of really good. You know, when we talk about that, the advice from the people who have been editing this stuff. Like, I would love Wolfgang to do another one of these, right? Like, Wolfgang's got so much knowledge about what makes good and bad adventures that people yeah. are not paying attention to. So, and it, you know, boy, be, you know, that just. Yeah. Why don't we do why don't we do one of these on an upcoming show? We'll get Wolfgang back, you back, that right, Anna? Because awesome. yeah. Wolfgang owes you a lot of favors. <laughs> uh, well, he, he's paying me too. So. He's paying you too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh but we can well, yeah, so that's sure. a great yeah. idea. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, how to write adventures don't suck, And I think so, and I think yeah. like if you you know if you were to if you were to go read Wolfgang's articles throughout all of the different Gobel guide books that he's written for, you yeah. could probably distill a list like this too. And I I sort of did. Like I made a whole list of like how do I want to have my my adventures designed in in Ruins of the Grendel Roots so that they are that they they're kind of nailing what they wanted to nail. And I took a lot of different stuff, but this was a big one for that. So I, I like it a lot. Very cool. Love that. Um I'm going to go to one here that um, some people and said, I wish I had all the player's option books for 2E. I, was that you, Katia, 134? Someone said that in chat, and I cannot agree with you more when it's you're talking about a certain thing that I love. And, of course, now i got I got so many books in here. I put too many in. Here it is. Is that it? Oh, our Swedish friend Skagath hosting the stream. Good to see you, Skagath. Hey. Hope things are going well. I need to talk to you about uh, Gary Khan. And that is this book here, um, the Player's Option Spell and Magic Book. And you can see, look at how beat up this softback is for second edition. <laughs> yeah. Now, the question is, why? And the, and the answer is very simple. This is how, this tells you how to build a specialty priest. So, uh, uh, with all the proper spheres, and everyone knows... I love specialty priests so much that I have 40 some different specialty <laughs> priest classes made between player characters and NPCs. All Greyhawk, most of them Greyhawk based, but you know, and they're all classes onto, into their own. And it really takes clerics and makes them very flavorful. You know? And so, yeah, and fifth edition does it a little bit, but I. There's really no difference between, uh, if I'm wrong, a, a sun priest of one religion to a sun priest of another. They're kind of the same, I would, right? Uh, I, the, I, I think the cleric... So one thing that 5th edition, I think, has done really well is the idea of the subclasses that they've got. And the subclasses definitely have some very different feeling to them. So a war priest and a sun priest, or a, a cleric of light, a cleric of war, a cleric of death, they feel very different from one another. Cleric of storm... Um, they feel very different from one another. But and not from a deity, not from uh, Mayheen and Greyhawk to a uh, Forgotten Realms deity. The no. The Storm deities are the same. Yes. Yeah. If you're a Storm Cleric in Greyhawk or a Storm Cleric in Forgotten right. Realms, they are the same. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Oh, they're all over Gribbly. Gribbly, uh, they're all over the place, man. All over Greyhawk for me. So Yeah. And that's, so, so that's sort of the fifth edition design idea is they don't want a world. So they for the for the first time they had their only new class, and the, the in, in six years and that class was only for Eberron for like a year and now it's also available for everything else and that was the Artificer, so 
Oh. Yeah, they yeah, the Wizards of the Coast, they are a world. So they they get they don't they get a lot of crap for this. Um but I would argue they are a world agnostic. The the, the stuff that's in 5th edition is world agnostic for that's almost true. almost always. And yet people think it defaults to Forgotten Realms and I don't think that's true. Like if the core books do definitely don't default to Forgotten Realms, but a lot of their adventures do. So people think that therefore the rest of it does. And that's not really true. I don't think. Um, but yeah, they don't, they don't have, you know, you could, right? Like the, the nice thing about the way that subclasses work in, in 5e is it's, I don't think they're that terribly hard to design. Uh, if you wanted to kind of homebrew a, a subclass that was like unique to your world's oh, version easy. of a God. It's easy yeah. to do. It's a couple pages. Um, and then you can, you know, as long as you're willing to change it, like as you test it and it turns out you were play open. testing is a big thing. So uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll, yeah, it's a big thing. You really need to, uh, whether it's right in the middle of, Hey, make your own, make your players the guinea pigs. We've done sure. that uh, yeah, multiple you have times. To be able to say, tell your players no under, <laughs> yeah. Or we're changing that, that. That, yeah. It turns out that was broken. Yep. Yeah. Like I gotta tell that to Tim Allen and our newest person I have to tell no to Anna Casey a hundred thousand times. Oh from yes, Hall you've because, had yeah I, I haven't uh, had difficult so now. yeah I haven't yeah, yeah I haven't yeah mm -hmm. yeah but it's it's gotta bad. tell him no, but you have to do that you have to be willing to <laughs> yeah. say no um, absolutely with uh with what you're doing or um, you lose control as a DM yeah it's like a DM you don't give players what they say what they want you it, you give them what they really want so to speak not what they're asking for you give yeah. them what they want and that not Go necessarily the same thing all the time and yeah. that's the, the kind of the art to be able to tell what the players really want not what they're asking for and it, it's it's tough at times mike i even have an emote it's called no just no <laughs> and, uh, it's a, there you go. It's an old yeah. friend of mine with a finger up his nose with no on his forehead. There I posted it in chat. There it's it a is, tier yeah. three emote, so only I can use it. <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah. No uh, one else gets the no. Are they so? Are those uh, location based or church organization based? They are deity church organization based. I'd say Gribbly because um, you know we have Heronius and there's Heronius in Shieldlands and there's Heronius in Friandi and there's Heronius in Greyhawk, and I'm not that detailed, you know. So <laughs> I got 45 to keep track of as it is. Wow. So, yeah. Mike, do you, let's see. Uh, Dwayne Costa asks, do you think Ghost of Saltmarsh succeeded as a 5e adventure book? How do you feel about the fact that Greyhawk is its default setting? It's not its default setting, Dwayne. It is. You, it is? For, 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 Ghost, for Ghost of Saltmarsh, it is. Okay, but it's um, really not in Greyhawk. Ghost of Saltmarsh is set in Greyhawk. Oh, yeah. It yeah. is. Yeah, okay. it is. It's definitely set in Greyhawk. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But there are yeah. rules for, for ideas for placement. Yeah, you can play, you can play in other places, but it's definitely, yeah. it's definitely set in Greyhawk. Oh, yeah. And I and I ran it like so. So Ghost of Saltmarsh was a campaign. Uh, so it's a for for anybody that doesn't know, Ghost of Saltmarsh is a book of a bunch of uh, classic adventures that are kind of pay, put together into a series that you can run sort of from one to nine or ten, and uh, based around the sinister secret of Saltmarsh and um, Danger Dunwater, the final Dunwater. enemy, yeah, and, those, and those three plus four others. Tamaro's fate and a bunch of others. Yeah, Tamaro's fate yeah. is in there. Yeah. yeah, one one that I hated called Isle of the Abbey. Oh. Um, it's the only one that I didn't like in the book. <laughs> it's really bad. Uh, and but all of them are. And uh, what's the uh, the styes? Really creepy, uh, yeah. Lovecraftian one. So, but it is set. It's set. Yeah, it's set. Salt Marsh is set in Greyhawk, and and you have all the empires, and you have King Scotty, and the, you know, okay. uh, all that stuff. Yeah. And um, I, I loved it, and I thought I thought it was a successful book. I I loved running it. I loved I you know I was very happy with it. Uh, there's, it's got, it's a, it's another one of these books that's got like a ton of stuff you can go back to. Um, my friend James Indicasso wrote a lot of stuff for it and wrote a lot of like the sub adventures that are in the back. So it's a real book you can squeeze a lot of information out of. And it was my only time so far running a Greyhawk campaign. Wow. And I, and I liked that it, it, it has a lot of really neat stuff for Greyhawk in it. Um, that, that isn't big world expanding. It's stuff that's like around salt marsh. Um, but it gave the flavor of it enough, you know, to, to, for me to really kind of enjoy it. So, so yeah. I good to it. hear. Yeah. yeah. Very good to hear. I, uh, we have, we have, when we had Wolfgang on, Wolfgang was one of the main authors on it. He, you know, I, yep. I have my beefs with it, but then again, you know, I'm old school. So, <laughs> you know. yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's one of those, like, for me, it's, it's great. Cause I, I don't know. I, I, you yeah, know, I don't. For, for 
diehard Greyhawk fans, the yeah. problem was that it was not much new in it. We yeah. had no. seen and heard most of sure. it already before. It was, hey, as uh, long it was as it's good, accurate, that's probably yeah. pretty good. It was a bit like the latest Star Wars movie. It was a remake of the old one, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, and and right. the new Star Wars fans were like, oh, it's awesome. They blow up a Death Star and they do blah, blah, yeah. blah. And it was like, well, a we seen that Death movie Star. like 30 years ago. Why? So, yeah. Why would yeah. you build a third Death Star? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> blown up two already. So why build I have a, a, I have a fix. I have a head fix for that, by the way. Okay. Uh, which is that the third, the the, the uh, star, whatever, star killer base is actually an old Sith weapon that they uh. reconstituted, and it wasn't built. Uh, see, that's a, that would have been good if they had explained right. that in the because movie. that way you're like, yeah. oh, the Death Star was actually built on that as a model. And yet they pulled out the old one. And then it ties yeah. into the third movie where you've got the Sith coming back. And yeah. Uh, it was like they already built so it. Much so they better They'd already built it. it. So it's not yeah. like they screwed up and made another stupid yeah. thing that get blown up. That's a good point. That's a great point. So that's my little headcanon. So, yeah. Mike, uh, uh, Steve, like Steve of Blood Wild asks, do you, do my, and I don't know this, so do modern artificers third to fifth edition have racial restrictions like the one and two E's? Nope. No. There you go. Yeah, I mean the whole idea of racial, racial, racial things in five E is changing completely anyway. Because now yeah. you can actually define your own. Uh, you can move your attribute points around between races. So if you decide you want to be a really smart half orc, you could be a smart half orc. These are all Tasha, you know, changes that came in Tasha's, uh, sure. which I think I, I really like. I think I think yeah. they 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 help in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, I don't think classes in general have any kind of racial restriction. Um, there were sort of bad combinations, but now there's not even that. Right now, now if you want to be a you know gnome barbarian, you're good, you know, and you'll be just as tough as a half orc barbarian. So, so, yeah. uh, so JB Garrison, uh, so what's your el the elevator pitch for your current campaign? I know you got two things going on: Eberron and you have a Rime of the Frost Maiden, right? Yeah, now. well, I haven't started Rime yet, but okay. my Eberron, the, the 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 campaign pitch for my Eberron game is uh, it's called the Second Morning, and the idea is that a bunch of different political groups in Eberron are trying to. Uh, create a new version of the weapon that caused the morning. The morning is this event that destroyed an entire empire. A huge swath of the main continent of Corvair was destroyed in some kind of catastrophe, some kind of unknown catastrophe. And some during it, and it, it ended the it ended the the hundred year war known as the last war between seven nations, or maybe even more. And so there's the different political groups are going to try to recover it, and it's sort of a cold war. You know, it's like a it's a Cold War plot of like you know all these different groups trying to get the bomb in the fifties, right? And and I, you know that's what I'm modeling it after, but set in the Eberron world. Okay. And so it's got a great villain who's been like changing sides, and you know they've been trying to thwart the villain, and the villain's trying to thwart them, and then they're going across this wasteland. And I stole a lot from Stephen King's The Wasteland, the Dark Tower series, and um. Yeah, so they did a lot of kind of political intrigue in cities, and now they're going like exploring, and now they're going to these city ruins. So, uh, but the whole the whole elevator pitch is, uh, you know, Cold War Cold War style high fantasy in Eberron. Think you know nineteen fifties Cold War stuff. So yeah. Um, so Caddy one three four s uh, says, I would love to see your Eberron game written up as an adventure. Yeah, I wouldn't count on it. Um, <laughs> I mean, so you can piece together, you know, I've got, uh, I'll probably, I think for my Patreon backers, I think my patron backers, maybe it might be everybody can get access to my Notion notebooks. So I, I do all of my campaign prep in a tool called Notion, which I, I, I love it's and I an recommend. It's an awesome tool. Yeah. yeah. And tool. I, and I built a, I built a template for it for D and D games that's built around the lazy DM style. And so I've got all of my session notes in there. I've got all of my NPCs, all my locations, you know, I've got all this stuff in there that, um, you know, kind can kind of piece together the thing, but it's a very dynamic campaign. It's not the kind of thing that I could easily write up into something that someone else could run because it, it changes direction so heavily. Uh, but I really recommend grabbing Eberron Rising of the Last War, the big published D&D &D book for Eberron and building campaign, you know, use what's in there to build awesome campaigns. Cause there's a lot of, it's, it's my favorite campaign book, you know, campaign source book and world source book. Uh, although Midgard is really great too. Uh, Anna, Midgard. Midgard <laughs> Anna. Yeah. I love Midgard. I've got Anna it right works. Here. And it's got all the maps in there. Yeah, yeah. I got all the maps. Yeah. Um, so Midgard is great. Uh, but I, but I found that the Eberron rising the last war book, like you can just squeeze 
so much out of it to build awesome Eberron adventures. And that's what I really wanted to do. So if you want like the, you know, if you want the, the, the campaign that I had, just grab the best parts of, of the Eberron book and make, make a campaign from it. Like there's just so much stuff in there. That's great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, 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 you know, the, the things that I run for a home campaign and then the things that I publish are usually in separate piles. All right. Uh, so the question was, all right. So notion, um, cannibal yeah, asked notion. about it. I don't know anything about yeah, it. So, um, notion yeah, is really cool. I have a, hang on. I'll paste a link in the chat. Am Great. Yeah. Paste Please link, link another thing on your shout out. I don't have your Patreon link. Feel free to link your Patreon. In. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. No and problem. Now I'm going to upset you, Mike, by saying that there is a new cool tool that I've moved from notion. I use notion still a little bit, but I've moved to <laughs> called legend keeper. Oh, it's I'm like a ledger notion. Keeper. Yeah, it's lo notion for DMs. Huh. huh. And it's super cool, super cool. So so yeah, it's called Legend Keeper. Legend Keeper? Yeah, legendkeeper.com in one All right. word. I will. Yeah. Like, I will please link your and, Discord and, into. Yeah, and he has oh, a page too. And it's, uh, if it's you get whatever, really you don't have to do it. Just, yeah, that's but, cool. Yeah. I can do it. Yeah. Yep. So there you go. So we get people in your Discord. I, I got to join your Discord. I haven't joined it. Yeah. So. Oh, I have to look at yeah. the Patreon here. Yep. Very cool. Um, yeah, Legend Keeper. I'll have to check it out. It's going to take a lot to get me to go away from Notion at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I used Notion for like two years, and it was it was a hard... I still use it for some parts. Yeah. But, but it's... Yeah, yeah the, one, the one thing Notion doesn't have that I really wish it did, that it looks like this, just looking at their demo, is annotation for maps. Yes. Right? That's the one thing I don't have, and, yep. and, and I have to like... Yep. Do a and, bunch of goofy stuff. To the database stuff in Notion is so cool because you can yeah. add things and and yeah. So so, but yeah. So so but those two tools are are my go to now to make campaigns. Cool. I'll check yeah. it out. Very very cool. I like the look of it. Yeah. Alrighty. So um, this book, the monsters know what they're doing. Yes. Certainly they do. Please tell me about this one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my friend Keith Amon wrote this book. It's a very popular book. It's, I think, like number 30 best-selling RPG book on, on Amazon wow. right now. Yeah. Yeah. He really nailed it. So he has a blog that's also called Mon the, Mo the Monsters Know or Monster Knows. And his, his I, there's a thing I like about this book that isn't that that uh, isn't on the surface. So most people like it because they 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 talk about how the the fifth edition monster manual does not have a tactics section for their monsters. It doesn't describe how they act in combat. And so he basically wrote long tactical descriptions of what monsters do in combat. But what I really love about his book is that it it constantly reinforces how you should be paying attention to the numbers of a stat block to understand what a monster is like. So what does it mean when a monster has a wisdom of 14, but an intelligence yep. of eight? Mm -hmm. What does it mean when they're high charisma or, or low yep. charisma? Yep. Uh, how will they act differently because of the stats that they've got? And for me, he's not just talking about tactics, like make sure to have your artillery in the back and your brutes up front so that, you know, the brutes should be blocking so that you can't. It's not, it's not like grid tactics. It's, it's getting your head into the monster based on the monster's description and sometimes mechanical description in the book. And that is a really powerful, uh, uh, really powerful tool for a DM to, to, to treat monsters well. That you're like, intelligent monsters act differently than non-intelligent ones. And, yep. um, and so the book is constantly reinforcing that. And it helps out with a lot of monsters that are really tricky. Liches and vampires are just hard to run. And it's got good advice for how to run liches and vampires to be to be effective. Or it talks about like the Lamia, you know, the Lamia is a is a monster that's not really intended to be fought. Right, because right? it doesn't it's, do a lot of damage. It's uh, you know, it's it something. It doesn't do a lot of damage, yeah. but boy, if it's at the center of an empire, that whole empire is going to be on your ass. Yeah. So you know, he, he, so it's a really really good, very well respected book, very popular book. Uh, people really love it. So yeah, it's 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 one that I that I that I think is really worth. Uh, Awesome. Attention to, yeah. Something, uh, I'm not, I, guess, I, I have not read any of these, so I really need to get, <laughs> get at it with these uh, very um, cool. It's worth it, yeah. All righty. We're going to go to some third edition. Mm. And uh, these are by, uh, these are the Sword and Sorcery core, core rule books for Relics and Rituals. Ah, yeah. Love these, and I've I've pushed these a lot, and I I have pilfered so many spells, so many magic items, so many. I use 
I have feats merged into my proficiency system in one E2E, so we have a joint system with both of them. These books are both great. Um, there's also one called Excalibur, which I use a little bit too. Yes, thanks, Mystery. Uh, but some spells that are really different, and a lot of them have made it into my game on a permanent basis, and you'll see you'll see them. So I recommend these. You can get these fairly reasonably too in, in hardback on eBay to this day, maybe even on Amazon, but you know, they're available. You just gotta look and take your time, but uh, I would recommend them both. I don't even know who the authors are of these, to be honest with you. Um, normally I do, but I, I don't even know who wrote these. So let me see uh, who, who uh, uh, developers... Ken Cliff, Stephen Week, and Stuart Week. I don't know them. Don't know them from uh, uh, a whole series of. I have a few yeah, of them, but I don't have sword, all of them. Yeah, right and this was in the. Uh, these are, I think, they're three point because they have D twenty system on them. Yeah, it's they had the scarred lands. That's where they came from. That was their setting. Yeah. Uh, and I will put um, up to third edition. I'll take anything that is a good idea and, and merge it in. And uh, we have thousands of spells, and I just love having spells that my guys don't know anything about them. Right. When that spell comes, you know, and uh, yeah. so ask him whether he is double lead. So uh, there is a there is uh, a fifth edition uh, book similar to this done by our good friends at Cobalt Press called Deep Magic. Oh, and um, yeah, you can. I, I was just taking a look at like where's the best place to get it, and it's it's thirty bucks for the PDF on D drive through, but it's fifty four bucks for the PDF and hardcover from uh, from Cobalt Press. So that's the one you want to get <laughs> because it's way, you know, you're getting the, yep. the hardcover book for whatever that is, $25. I think that was is... one of the best going Kickstarters that Cobalt yes. had. Yes, and, yeah. and it is a, I think it's like, it's got 700 spells in it or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's like a huge tome. It's uh, a I massive wasn't involved tome. in making it, but it was, yeah, it was a huge thing. Yeah, and so it is a... Um, I'm gonna yeah, I'll paste the link into the chat. So Nagori uh, just is thirty nine dollars on Amazon. That's cool. Yeah. So it is again. It's 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 exactly what you're talking about. It's a great way for a DM to have access to a whole bunch of spells that your players won't recognize, and you can sort yeah. of custom build monsters by by whipping out these spells. That's a trick I only learned recently, and and it's a real fun one to like. I did it with a. Uh, Robert Schwab took a bunch of his nasty spells from Shadow of the Demon Lord and made fifth edition versions. And I had a bunch of hags that were casting them and they were oh, doing yeah, terrible yeah. things like like teleporting people half in and half out of a wall. Nice! Or, or flaying, yep. flaying yep. bits of their skin off. And there was like Aww. this terrible spells that like hags would totally use. Yep. And it just freaked my players out. They were just... It, what is that? Freak, like, why? Yeah, why? What's in you the know? box? Your eye's gonna explode. What? You know, why is my eye gonna explode? So yeah, it was it was really yeah, and 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 uh, I have it somewhere here. Uh, that 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 deep magic book is just uh, a great way to like pull that off the shelf and create some blood mages, you know, cult, blood cultists. Oh, uh, blood mages are, um, from uh, Dragon Age. They had the blood mages yeah, in there. Right. So you could uh, have these, like, really creepy spells. Oh, yeah, it's good stuff. We have uh, so in my game. I have witches. Uh, and Timothy, you know Timothy Brandon at all? Man, he's mm -hmm. great with uh, with wit uh, making up the witch class. Uh, so and Necromancer is a custom of my own. And so, but Blood Mages that sounds really interesting. I'm gonna, uh, you know, I love Dragon Age too. I loved all the uh, the games by them. I wish they'd come out with a new right. one. They said 2022 or 23. Who knows? We'll probably see that when we see Star Citizen, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I only did the Kickstarter for that, uh, you know, <laughs> eight years ago. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, one my day. gosh. You got that uh, garage with your one ship in it. Phew. Well, yeah. you can move around and you can do a lot of stuff in uh, it. It's just a full-blown uh, game yet, but uh, you can do a yeah. hell of a lot I was, of stuff. I, I was so hoping for Squadron 42 to come out. I, I, I <laughs> yeah, love that. That will take play. a while. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I know we have this one here for you too, Mike. This is like the fifth one on your best list here, and that's Dungeon World. Dungeon World, yes. Sage Latora and Adam Kobel wrote a book based on Apocalypse. Oh, World. Adam Kobel wrote it. Yeah, uh, okay. based on based on Apocalypse World. Okay. And it is a. It was the first book that just like it's like somebody bought the book and started beating me in the head with it, right? And and I I really made me think differently about what DMing is and how DMing it has you know in particular uh, has these sort of mantras for, for dungeon mat for, for, for GMs for dungeon world. And it's like, be fans of the players, right? Like play to see what happens. It's got these sort of like one line philosophies that just, I thought are so powerful 
and change how we think about DMing, that the DM is not the, you know, for me, that the DM is, is a servant of the story and a servant of the story of the player, of the, of the characters. And, our, and our, our role is not to be their adversary. You know, it's like a, and, you know, it's like a craps game, right? That like the dealers are on your side, at, you know, in a, in a craps game. Everyone's on your side on a craps game. They all want you to win because they're all going to make money like you're making money. They're going to get tips based on your good. <laughs> True. Right? So everyone, they don't want you to lose. They want you to win. And the only enemy are the dice. And that idea that the, you know, how do you make the dice the enemy? How do you make, you, you put hard, they have this concept of like hard moves and soft moves in Dungeon World. of Like hard moves are like putting a real, put your thumb really on them. Like a, a bad situation happens. And then soft moves are like, you know, a subtle, a subtle sort of things, uh, you know, sort of happen. But, but that idea of like, we're all on the same side and we're all here to watch the story happen is such a powerful one. So there's a lot of, I, I joke about Dungeon World, that Dungeon World is sort of like uh, Velvet Underground, that like, you know, there are only 2,000 copies of the original Velvet Underground album sold, but every one of them ended up creating a new band. That's you know? true. And it's, it's like every, you know, Dungeon World is like, you know, the, and it's not really true because it's pretty popular, but like the joke would be, it's the least popular RPG, but everybody turned into an RPG developer. You know, and it's and it's because it like for reading this after fourth edition changed my philosophy completely on how I approached running games. So it is a is a really good book to kind of get that. And I think the text is all online for free. It's a Creative Commons book, and I think you can read, you know, a lot of the material that I think is most valuable. You can you can read for free. But it's a yeah, it's an it's an interesting take. And if you and if you want to see what a what they call it a PB PBTA a powered by the apocalypse game. Um, this is an example of a powered by the apocalypse game. It's got its own kind of engine that's, you know, where instead of having like success and failures on rolls, you have these sort of like success with a cost, you okay. know, and the success with costs happen more often, either, either failure with a boost or success with a cost happen more often than either successes or failures tend to do. So, yeah. I'm going to go there and I shouldn't, but will Adam ever come back? Can't say. Yeah. Okay. That's, it's that's a sad crazy. thing what happened, but you know, uh, just a uh, guy had a lot of, you know, the guy was a good, super popular DM, you know, and I'm, yeah. I wish him the best. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's tough. I mean, it's a good case in how not to handle a situation like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, like easy, easy to say, like you're in a spot, but yeah, I, 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 I don't, I don't. It was one thing for the event to happen for, 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 for right, but then yeah, beyond yeah. But I don't think he, you know, I don't think he yeah. handled it as well as he could have, and I don't think I don't think people. Uh, that's a that's a whole another show with a whole another more yeah. serious topic, and just just note, and I always say this, and I don't mean disrespect to anyone out there over this, but to note that myself and Mike and anyone else out there who streams, we are one word or phrase away from us disappearing. Ah. <sighs> Yeah, it, it, it's true. It, 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 <laughs> it is, is. It is true. Once, once act of stupidity. Yeah, it, you know, I, I, we and, all do. Like I said, stupid things. You know, and, and I, I've had, I, 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 I've, I've made blunders, we, and we, we all have. We all have. Yeah. And, and Anna, when I first met Anna as a friend, Anna yeah. said to me, and this is very good advice for anyone out there who's even thinking of streaming. If you something happens, you immediately address it and you immediately. Say hey, we're sorry. A apologize. Yes. Apologize yeah. to me. Uh, uh, Don't double down on your, yeah. what you're doing, yeah. dumb, so to speak. Right, exactly. To, to you need to address it right then and there. Yeah. Yeah. And as you come, as we become more popular, uh, you know yeah. that potential. Yeah. That... yeah, I mean that's that's certainly something that I've I've yeah. had to pay attention to. I, I my, the, you know big blunder that I made recently was uh, being very critical of Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, at like the worst time to be critical of a book like that. <laughs> and, yeah. And I realized, like, I, you know, I've, 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 I've changed from having a couple hundred Twitter followers and being able to bitch about something <laughs> to having thousands of followers, yeah. you know, yeah. where it gets spread around. I also blame the algorithms. I think the algorithms are, <laughs> will send hot stuff to the very people who are going to oh, be yeah. angriest about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as soon as you stir up emotions, that that yeah, it, it, the, the algorithm loves attention. yeah, the yeah. algorithm yeah. loves emotions, which is why I'm I'm kind of like I'm just going to do my DM tips over there, and I'll yeah. complain about stuff in Discord where there's 20 people. You know, yeah, and yeah, yeah, and, and uh, I could explain myself. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Live it's, streaming it's is is something that uh, I've learned by mistakes. 
over have, the last three years, you yeah. know, and, and we yeah, all, we to, but yeah. there's different varying levels of mistakes, you know, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's intentional things and then there's uh, unintentional and uh, yeah. if, if something comes up, you address it and that's happened a couple of times and we've addressed it. So yeah. Yeah. I will get out of that serious topic now. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a real tough one. Yeah. It is. Yeah. A, it is really it's not a, easy. It's not a, easy a on any one. side. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So if you've seen this, that is my part of, what's that one yeah. one third one half what i have are, are these all your cleric books these are yes. uh, they're all titled um <laughs> they're color-coded classes elementals illusionists specialty priest npc specialty priest necromancer druids wow. avengers miscellaneous mag creatures magic items are the ones i have here and there's a lot of others alchemists there's yeah. witches there's all sorts of things and these are my custom rules so say we pull out a uh, necromancer right i'll pull out necromancer and i've developed my uh Necromancer spell lists, which are all compiled with all the cross references of where all the spells are. Ugh. And then uh, on the Necromancer class itself, yeah, yes, Casey, you have this now. And then all the other special abilities, all the spells, all compiled in here, unless they're in a main reference book. And then they, they don't need to go in here. So there you go. And that's what I've tried to do with uh, the level of detail for, for the campaign we have. And uh, mm -hmm. so they're all go-to for me, you know. And that's why I show that. It's something uh, something I take some great pride in. And no, I will never give it all out at once. I know someone <laughs> said, oh, just release all that. I'm like, no. <laughs> but rules are coming. Rules are coming. And I'll, I'll say that at the end. Uh, I've been in touch you know, with Carlos and we're working on something uh, that you, a lot of you know about. I just assume awesome. it was your cheating audit file. See, see, Naz, oh my gosh. I know. So, so the Naz, Mike, is our longest subscriber. And he's a 5E guy. And he's like half my age. So, but he <laughs> caught us when we had like five, five viewership and has stayed on there. What's it? 30 months now, Tim. And, but see, we got five years here and, uh, they respect, yeah. uh, they were, they know what not to do. Right. Is that what you say, Tim? With, with us old school people. So we have, we have a mix yeah. of all different additions here in the community. A J primer. Yes. Get down to a J primer at the end. Very long. Yeah. So now if I said, that's what she said now, then that's, that's me being stupid. Right. But I won't. Oh, I just did. Sorry. So, okay. Uh, so, Mike, what other books you have uh, you just want to discuss? Some other besides the five? Because I only have put so many uh, in here. I'm going to have the schooler just go automatically again. Yeah, well, that's why I like. I was making my giant ass list, and I was like, we're not going to be able to talk about all these. I know, uh, but we're going to. We're almost <laughs> at, we're at two hours already, Mike. So just yeah. let us know when you need to go, and we'll we'll, we'll start winding down things. So yeah, probably I'd, I'd probably need to. Okay. Going. Okay. So um we got our Harry Potter a thon. My wife oh, and I go through every year during Christmas. Oh, well, that's awesome. So, <laughs> all right, so look, Harry Potter movie. The two hours flew by. So yeah, I um know. I can yeah. talk all day. What I can and I can, we gotta have you back. We definitely oh, yeah. need to have I'm, you back. I'm, I'm absolutely. Happy to, I'm, absolutely. Uh, this has absolutely been, been a great back. discussion. Great. So yeah. what would you like to shout out? Man, uh I'll shout out my 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 friend MT Black's uh book, uh, Anatomy of an Adventure. Okay. Uh, so MT Black is a very successful adventure writer for the DMs Guild. Uh, got his start, I think he started on the DMs Guild, and he definitely went down the philosophy of like writing lots and lots and lots of adventures, and um, and then seeing what sticks and what works. And he wrote a book recently, five dollar PDF that's available on Drive Through. A bug. Um, uh, five dollar PDF on Drive Through of his experience writing these adventures. And what he's and what he's learned about writing them, and uh, it's a really interesting, really good, really good PDF. Um, and and I I I dig it. And uh, yeah, so I definitely uh, uh, I definitely recommend it. I definitely recommend people people check it out. A good good person's view from somebody who's who's you know really really uh, changed things up in the last three years in that in that industry. So uh, definitely worth checking out. Thank you. And uh, I hope you have, have had fun with this. As we've, we're, we're having, Absolutely. having a Love blast. It. Yeah, really, yeah, yeah. Um, just learning a lot. There's a lot of stuff that I need to uh, I need to read up on too, and just get get that perspective. It's always good to get a new yeah. perspective on uh, on on what on DMing, especially yeah. just to yeah. throw in one or two ideas. Anna, what's going on? A lot of things, but uh, Mike, you were so gracious that you 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 uh, plugged and 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 promoted someone else. That <laughs> like. So I'm going to do the same thing, and that's a good. I'm going to try and do that more on the show. Uh, creators and stuff that I like and 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 awesome. help out and stuff. So I have one um, 
Ted Fauster. He's a writer and he's also kind of a cartographer. And and he he makes old school dungeons that that dungeon maps and they are beautiful. They're really, really works of art. And he has a patron that Ted draws dungeons and it's kind of it's kind of awesome. So you can link it in so, on if you want. Yeah, so I'm exactly I'm I'm copying it here so it's it's kind of awesome so if you like these old school hand drawn dunyan maps that are simple but very artistic i think you should take a look at at uh, ted uh, ted's maps that they're kind of awesome and he's a really oh, cool yeah. guy he has a lot of of other blogs and and do a whole bunch of other stuff too but but that's the kind of really cool cool things and he's written some awesome books and stuff too cool so that, but when it comes to to my stuff, I'm I'm taking the 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 days between Christmas and New Year's to dig into a little bit, just having fun with with my maps and, and my work. So I'm trying to be really creative. But I'm one is I did some experimenting and stuff, and there will be a long blog post coming in a couple of days, digging deep into map technology stuff. So if you're <laughs> not into the if you're into that bit, you will love it. And all my other patrons skip that post because that will be a deep dive into the technology side of it. I've written a couple of uh, blog posts and stuff about the campaign side of things. Here comes one of the technical heavy ones, so to speak. And and I'm also, today I've been overhauling my uh, symbols. That's one of the housekeeping things. The symbols are now 20 years old and they are kind of scruffy and they look a little bit weird uh. when you zoom up and, <laughs> and kind of look at them carefully. So I've overhauled them and they will be clean and that's part of making them into a GIS system. Then they need to have clean SVG graphics. And that's what I've been, been doing today. That's today's project. I'm basically done. So so I have all so that is coming tonight or tomorrow. They're coming in blog post. And Whoa, I'm not changing cool. them. I'm just refining them, making sure that they are symmetrical and, and, and similar size and don't look as scruffy as when I created them in Coral Draw 20 years ago when I barely knew what I was doing. So <laughs> so it's a little bit uh, so that's been today's project and then it is uh, getting into um, it's right now it's kind of tech tech deep in, in that way because i'm launching i'm putting in the last bits in because i need to decide what uh, workflow to use for my next generation Greyhawk maps. So it's a decision that will be kind of able, I will have to live with that decision for at least 10 years, maybe <laughs> even 15 years. That it took 20 crazy. years to get the other one out of the door, so to speak. So, so, so that means that it will, it's a, so it's not a decision I will take lightly because I don't want to go back on doing it. So, so, so I need to, to have something that is, so, so that's what I will write about. And I'm almost 90% there. And the two tool I will be used mainly is called World Machine and, and I'm on the alpha test team. So I just had a couple of things in the new version that I can't use the new version because I, so I wrote the, the, um, the author of the program a long email today saying, I can't use it because of this, 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 and this. So I either have to go with the old version, which means that it will make, take much longer, but would be possible, or I have to have the new version fixed. So that way I'm, I'm going to sit and hold out a couple of weeks to see if there will be a fix or not. So that kind of put me away a couple of weeks. So that's why I have to dig into other things. So right now it's very tech heavy, but it's, so, so I'm, I'm basically gearing up for the start of next year. And I'm going to talk one minute about the two big projects for next year. And one is Lendor Isles. And the other one is to take my existing Greyhawk map and put it into GIS. Cool. And, and that is going to be probably take at least yeah, half the year uh, in full time. It, it will take the whole year and part time of the whole year to put that map into to GIS. And and the reason for that is that that way we can make different size version for different prints, and and you can change styles, and you can do a whole bunch of stuff. And the other big project, yeah, it's Lindor Isles. So I'm going to start digging through the pile of lens stuff, and I'm going to scan it. I'm trying to organize it. That will be a probably the biggest project in January, trying to, to sort out all that stuff. And, and, and then we'll see how we can, I can publish that stuff on, on the internet somehow. So we can kind of get all that get together and have it ready to, to start mapping Lendor Isles. Because I think by the end of January, I probably, then I will have figured out exactly how I will go about technically to do it. 
to get it all right, so to speak. So and, and start doing it. And in the meantime, I will run my campaign and and then I will do some work on the whole planet of Earth at the meantime, because there is a bunch of stuff that ties into the both the next generation of Greyhawk maps and also the the the, the GIS. So it's it right now it's kind of a, my own campaign is very kind of thinking about the campaign, thinking about the campaign world. But then on the mapping side, it's technology, technology, technology. It's file sizes, data formats, masks, and and yeah, all boring technical stuff. But unfortunately, <laughs> that needs to be there. So I, once I have it set up, I can just keep working and and cranking out content. So so it goes from, from R&D and then it goes into production. And right now I'm in an, in research and development phase. So so it's kind of, it goes back and forth. And then hopefully in, in by mid end January, I will go into production phase and I will just sit and crank out stuff. So that's basically what's there, so to speak. And I will write a, a kind of a detailed, a lot of these plans and stuff for next year coming up soon too. But I need to get a lot of that techno geek out of my head right now and write that down. Plus Anna's is doing thing. maps for Southlands too, right? Uh, well, Southlands maps are actually done. Done, that's yeah, right, they're as, done. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's done, thankfully. So, so I have some vacation from, from commissions and stuff now. I have, I have a couple of commissions coming up fairly soon that I have to dig into as well. But hopefully I can have some, some lots of Greyhawk time over. Thanks to all my patrons that makes it possible for yep. me to, to work on this stuff and not do that many other commissions all the time. Do some shout outs there. Well, Anna, thanks yep. for hopping on. Uh, what was the uh, sorry, Anna? What was the name of the tool that you were using in, in addition to Notion? Uh, uh, Notion, no, Legend Keeper. Legend Keeper. Yeah, Legend Keeper in one word, legendkeeper.com. and it's yeah. it's kind of a cool. I used to use. I, I a closed tool the called, tab, and I was like, oh god. Yeah, yeah. So so I used to use a tool called RealmWorks that was kind yeah. of awesome in its day, but they stopped developing it. So I realized I needed a new home for my campaign. So I moved to Notion like two years ago, and then I saw this pop up, and I was like, oh. so so yeah. So now I use both, and we'll see. I will probably continue to use both for they have different strengths, but Legend Keeper is going from strength to strength. So I really like it. Cool. Yeah. I have a quick question for you, uh, Mike, and that is: uh, yeah. Do you have you uh, tabletop miniatures war gamer? Have you ever were you ever into that? Not play? really. No, no, no. I've always been an RPG. Okay. So there yeah. you go, uh, Garrison, for that question. There, I have, right. I have, yeah. I have a boatload of Dwarven Forge, and I have a boatload of minis. Yeah. Um, but they were all for uh, for RPG. RPGs. Yeah. So, yeah. I, well, you know, for me, uh, we've kind of melded them in, but those massive combat ones they take way too long. Especially on the stream, man. It's yeah. just insane doing the doing the war gaming. Uh, but some people like it, and uh, tactically, you know, it, it can be fun, but it can be very, very slow. So, yeah. uh, all right, let me do these real quick, and then we'll do the giveaways and uh, get Mike out of here. So tomorrow night, we have we just got three more streams the next three nights because of the holidays because I got nothing better to do right. Nice. Tim City State Invincible Overlord he will be here DMing and I will be sitting there playing my character Davilia. It's the character's thirty years old, so uh, and uh, I put she thirteenth level Cavalier now. Tim I forget but uh, around that level and uh, they just got titles and nobility from the Overlord and now the Overlord's telling them to do all this crazy stuff so they, uh, t Tim is titled part 6 fix it so there you go and that's what we'll see tomorrow night and it's deadly because it's Tim DMing so you can only imagine uh, so that'll be tomorrow night I get a break from DMing and it's old school 1E with uh, the Tim crits so there you go finally a countess yes it only took me uh, till my I'm an old man in real life for that Tim so Tomorrow, um, Tuesday night, the bonus cabin, uh, the year in review, which I do every year. Um, I will get some other guests besides Anna. So we have uh, some other people to discuss this, but we're going to go through every, all the great stuff that's happened uh, for the community and the channel and all um, in, in 2020. And, we'll, you know, aside from Len passing, we had some wonderful, wonderful guests and, and people come on, Mike included. And we'll talk about yeah. all that and some adventures in the con. We had our own Greyhawk con in October and how well that went and, uh, and uh, some other coming things for Gary Khan as well. So that'll be Tuesday, Wednesday night, last stream of the year. Uh, and Magic Spells of Greyhawk. If you saw Mike Bridges' post on A to Z Spells, I saw that and I'm like, Mike, this is genius. Let's just do the show. On, we don't have a title topic on Wednesday. Let's just do the show on all magic spells that are Greyhawk based. And he's like, great idea. And I said, great idea. And I said, cool. But I didn't, you know, so Mike brought that up. So that's what we're going <laughs> to yeah. do. Uh, and that's as far out as I have 
planned. Uh, so we got, you know, next yeah, four Yeah, we usually nights. don't plan Legend and Lore until next week. Sometimes we plan yeah. a couple of weeks ahead, but usually only the next week after. Yes, Skag, uh, GrailCon was a blast, and now we got Gar Grailk Adventures coming up in GaryCon. All right, so the fundraiser's coming up. Underdark Uprising, 36 hours of streams. Eight streaming channels, nine DMs. So Tim is going to be DMing for uh, for uh, on Lord Gazumba at four AM that Saturday because he's a crazy person. Uh, but you know we got all these channels, and we're going to our goal is to double what we raised last year for Saint Jude. We raised twenty five hundred and twenty dollars last year. We're going for five thousand this year. So uh, that'll be February nineteenth and twentieth, and more details coming up on that in twenty twenty one early. And then uh, we're doing uh, Greyhawk Adventures. A lot of you have signed up, and a lot of you are working with us on this, and you. Know Know what a wonderful thing that is we're up to 46 events in gary con looking to get to 60 and i think we're gonna hit that easily because i got a ton of streamers haven't put their events in yet so um someone mentioned dr lupo and i uh, don't know i don't know blue um so uh, i'm losing my mind here i got so much going on let's do the giveaways all right let me uh close this out and hopefully i don't crash the stream here mike which, <laughs> can, which can happen with this uh, cloud bot mike do you use obs Yes. Okay. I yeah. use uh, I use OBS Studio. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I've seen that blue. He's a, a big Twitch streamer, and he raises a lot of money, and he's a huge partner. Yeah. We uh we do our own Greyhawk little community thing, and it goes very well for. And we have it set up through Tiltify this year, so we don't have to worry about double handing the money. It goes right into Tiltify. And that'll all be set up. It's going to work great. Let me close this out here. Oh, uh, giveaways. Uh, entries are closed. All righty. The first winner. This is for the Mike Shea Sly Flourish package. Okay. Um, I would love that blue, but that's a that's a huge ask for for him. I I have Eric Mona playing in that event, and that's a huge you know. So I got Eric playing in that finale of the fundraiser. Uh, that would be a cool thing. If you have a connection, blue, I would love to uh, for you to reach out. Look at that, Mike Saxton, Retro Gamer Meth. You're the winner of the of the uh, of the package. Good, congrats, Mike, Retro Gamer Meth. Great. Is, yes, good guy, Mike. So can uh, you uh, can you get me an email address? I will I will get him a, a, an email or uh, there he is Mike. Can you uh, whisper uh, Sly your yeah, email retro, address? Retro gamer. Retro yeah. gamer meth. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, he's on uh, he's on Twitter as well too. So uh, um, there you go. Uh, now the next two I will handle. The first one is the thirty dollar gift certificate from Troller Games. The winner is. DM David Keith, not Keith David, the actor, but David Keith. And uh, DM David Keith, I know you've uh, been in the hospital, so I'm glad you won. Congrats. Um, DM David Keith. Congrats there, David Keith, for winning that. And now the $25 gift certificate from Reaper Miniatures, uh, another wonderful sponsor of us. And the winner is, uh, uh, oh boy, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What happened here? Why did it close out? Oh, no. Did it close out? Ah, oh, it closed out on me. All right. So uh, it closed out on me, and now I'm screwed. So yeah, he's, he's on. He's good. He's good. Um, so guess what, everyone? The, the Reaper one closed out on me, so I'm going to have to randomize this completely. Uh, um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to roll my dice right here, and I'm going to go right down the list. And that's the only way I can do it. The stupid thing closed out. See, it does mess up. Uh, the winner, Molly78 uh, uh, is the number. I'm going right down. Let me count it. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80. Wow, look at all these people on. Yeah, technology. Yeah. Oh, I, Moose 2271. Moose 2271 on the third one. Moose, you on? I think you're on. Moose 2271. Moose 2271. Grats, man. All right, then you got the Reaper. Reaper, DMW Keith is the um, is the troller. I'm writing this up myself. Sorry about that, everyone. Congrats. Uh, by the way, we have more giveaways tomorrow, too. I got a ton of stuff for the holiday gifts. We have every night we're going to have them. So please um, come on in tomorrow night's game stream. Mike, thanks. Thanks for everything. Yeah, absolutely. That was a wonderful time. Really enjoyed it. Yes. Um, can you message DM David Keith? Uh, yeah, I, I, I got him. I got yep. him. Yeah. So um, what uh, – oh. 
see you soon. When are you on? When are you on again? When are you streaming again? So I stream knows. Sunday mornings. I try to do it like when no one would possibly want to watch. So um, <laughs> I, I I do my shows Sunday mornings from now. It's it's slowly gotten to about nine thirty to eleven. Uh, so I, I'm I'm really just dabbling in the in the world of streaming. I don't stream my games. I just streaming my prep. Um, but I also have the re reruns of it are on YouTube. So my YouTube channel has all of my DM prep sessions, about 130 of them. You do a you do a lot of um you do a lot of uh, great stuff for the community uh, you know and you got fourteen thousand YouTube subscribers so you're doing something right you know you know what yeah. I mean yeah so you're absolutely doing something right here Twitch is but just such a different animal it. live streaming it is it yeah. is but it's fun and uh, yeah, yeah no I like it I love I love doing it it's I did one I did a, a show yesterday just because I had like you I had time yeah uh, let me let me just BS about D and D for two hours. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great, and, and that's and that's the way to the way to do it. Um, um, but there's a you know there's a lot of other great things, and playing that game, it's a lot of the players may not want to be on or not, but you know uh, that's something yeah. That, I mean, I just my games are just my games, right? Yeah, they don't yes, need, yeah. they don't need to be broadcast to the world. Like we all have our games, and there's plenty of streaming games <laughs> that are way better than what I'll what, what you get from me. So enjoy those. And and you know, some days, uh, some day you may want to consider doing it. You know? Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we're going to raid into uh, Tabletop Notch, uh, great 5e stream. So we'll raid into them. Um, yeah, and that's true, Lazy. A lot of all people who play want to play for an audience. I agree 100%. Yep. Thank you all, and uh, well, Jay, hit the right button here. Yeah, Anna, it was, it was wonderful to, to chat with you tonight. Oh, yeah, the same. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jay, again for... Anytime, Anna, anytime. Yep. We'll see you all tomorrow night. Uh, seven, same time, 7.30 uh, Eastern time, and... Uh, Thank you all for a wonderful, awesome. wonderful, massive audience show tonight. So, yeah, uh, great. Wow. Take care, everybody. Yeah. Talk to you soon. Bye. Setting up the raid right now. Let's see if we can get um, over 80 into this raid. How's that sound? I'm just doing a random goal yeah. here. Let's see what we get. Raiding in. Let's see how many people go for it. Trust me, this happens. is a good 5 stream here. No, I'll take six, 67. They're going to be really happy with that. So, five, four, three, two, one. All right, 68. See yeah, you. Uh, one see you all tomorrow. One last. One last. One last one. Oh, oh no, they left. Oh, I'm not ready. Yeah, you gotta all love right. that when that happens. So let me get back uh, to my channel and get back here and turn this off. Hey, who are all these people? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I have a partnership with Tabletop Notch, so uh, I, I, I try, what I do is, uh, Mike, I, uh, I set up a green.